Good morning, everyone. Hello. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Martin Mann. I'm the head of the presidential department at the VZB Berlin Social Science Center, who is an academic partner of today's symposium. And I have the honor of saying good morning to all of you and giving a very short opening remark and uh, yeah, introduce, introducing you all uh, to today's symposium. Since the 1990s, one can observe a general trend of declining trust in science, or at least a trend that basic research is no longer seen as self-justified as such. The academic landscape reacted on this trend and put much effort in its activities outside teaching and performing research. The so-called third mission has been gaining traction for at least two decades now. The Wissenschaftsbarometer of the Robert Bosch Foundation has observed a counter trend in its latest version from late 2020. The COVID crisis led to a significant raise in trust in science. In April 2020, 73% of all respondents said that they have trust or full trust in science. In 2019, only 46% of the sample did so. However, whether the COVID crisis also affects in a positive trend in the midterm and in the long term will be subject to future research. And I'm personally very much interested what the Robert Bosch Foundation finds out in its next round of the Wissenschaftsbarometer, whether there is a counter trend. In any case, we have learned over the COVID years that in complex problems, political counseling should never be limited to one discipline only. Complex problems require complex answers, and we have seen that also a medical crisis will need experts from all potential disciplines to be solved. Needless to say, complex problems are societal problems and hence afford also expertise from the social sciences and humanities. In today's, in today's symposium, we are facing a festival of societal impact through the social sciences and humanities. We will celebrate breakthroughs coming from these disciplines, which make the lives of people all over the world better. Anyone who is not yet convinced that there is hardly a better way to spend taxpayers' money should watch our exchange today. The 10 winners who stand in the center of today's sessions and who were selected from a four-digit number of nominees give an outstanding example of how research can lead to societal progress. The VZB Berlin Social Science Center has been dedicated to basic research with a focus on problems of modern societies for over 52 years now. We are honored to act as academic partner of this symposium. And I shall send you good wishes from our president, Jutta Almendinger, who will happily join our discussions today afternoon. We are most grateful to the Volkswagen Foundation, represented by Adelheid Wessler today. The Volkswagen Foundation generously supports this symposium and is most passionate about societal transformations deriving from research, as the recently published new funding strategy of the Volkswagen Foundation convincingly shows. I cannot think of a better partner. Further, I want to thank the Falling Walls Foundation for bringing the entire world together here in Berlin, celebrating science and its power to shape an even brighter future. Finally, my heartfelt thanks go to Moritz Neugebauer, who has been heavily working over the last months in order to make this podium today uh, a success for all of you. I wish you all now lively debates, and I hope you have an enjoyable time here at this symposium and at the Falling Walls Summit in Berlin. Thank you. Yeah, good morning also from my side. Um, my name is Adelaide Westler, and on behalf of the Volkswagen Foundation, I'm very happy to welcome you also to this symposium here. 
As always, the Falling Walls Conference here is very diverse, is very inspiring, and I learned a lot about science engagement yesterday and about engineering sciences and the connection to enterprises and startups. But now today, I'm very happy that the Volkswagen Foundation is able to support this symposium on social sciences and humanities and the occasion of bringing the winners of the breakthroughs together with other partners in academia and business. This disciplinary focus, as Martin Mann has also mentioned already, aligns quite well with our funding because uh, more than half of our funding annually goes to projects from the social sciences and humanities. And this focus was even strengthened when we adopted our new funding strategy in the beginning of the year, in which uh, we besides other things, established a new profile area um, on societal transformations. And in this profile area, we want to fund really innovative research projects that address the major challenges that we are facing today all over the world. And of course, these challenges can only be addressed in an interdisciplinary and also international way. Therefore, I'm really looking forward to the discussions of today on originality, on methodology, on research formats and innovation in the social sciences and humanities. And before I close, my thanks also go uh, to the VZB as the academic partner of this uh, symposium. Of course, um, the Volkswagen Foundation also always needs these academic partners for putting things together and uh, organizing things from the um, yeah, from the organizational po uh, point of view. And also, of course, to the Falling Walls uh, Foundation. And so let me close by wishing all of us also fruitful discussions, many new insights, and thank you for your attention. Good morning also from me. My name is Rasha Kirakosian. I'm a professor and chairholder of Medieval German at um, Freiburg University. And it's my honor to guide you through today's um, program, which is quite tight, and which is why we don't want to waste time and um, get into the discussion. Now, the organizers have asked me to say a few words about my own work, and I have exactly one minute. So why are the Middle Ages relevant today? I thought I might speak about that. Two aspects I want to highlight. First, what kind of Middle Ages are we talking about? Quite often we use the term and we actually, what we actually mean is a very Eurocentric view of history. Not just a Eurocentric view, but also a view on a, a global history that is gauged to progress for a very restricted um, or very small uh, number of people for wide um, male aristocrats, um, Europeans, who had some sort of a change in the 16th century called humanism. And um, the rest of the society, when did the Middle Ages end for them? When did the Middle Ages end for women? When did they end for children? When did they end for Jews? And then speaking specifically about Europe, because the Middle Ages them, it, itself, that, that thing is very, actually a very European concept and it's highly problematic. So we need to, that, that's, that's why the first reason why I think the Middle Ages are relevant still today in the sense of we need to reflect about that. Second reason, um, the Middle Ages are not apolitical. Um, I have some colleagues who think that post-colonial theory does not apply to the Middle Ages because sure, surely it's a pre-colonial age. Um, now we could start and tackle that and think about, hey, sorry, but what are the Crusades or what are annexations in the Middle Ages, if not uh, precursors? Um, but also, um, more importantly, um, the Middle Ages are politicized and instrumentalized by various groups, especially by the alt-right movement at the at the moment. So I think it's an illusion to believe that as a medievalist you can be apolitical and you can conduct your research apolitically. I think that's an illusion and uh, that's also why um, the study of the Middle Ages is relevant and interesting. And having said that, let's get to our first panel which is about creativity and originality. 
We have three fantastic speakers. We have Sabina Leonelli and Korai Chaliskan and Chris Bale. And the format is going to be the following. Each of these speakers is going to um, speak here in front and give their statement. And after that, after the three statements, we will open the floor for discussion and for questions from you. Now, just before we really jump into the discussion, I just want to warn you, and um, by welcoming the youngest guest of the Science Summit, my son, who is eight weeks old. So if I need to jump off this stage because he needs my attention, I really hope for your understanding. And now let's welcome our three speakers, yeah? Okay, so a good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the invitation here. I'm really honored, and it's fantastic to have the opportunity to exchange thoughts with such an illustrious um, audience. So um, what I'm going to be talking about, oops, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is understanding data as a pretty fundamental notion. I think all of us have had something to do uh, with this, and this is more from a philosophical point of view. So. Um, the starting point from my research is this idea that you know, many people are now talking about big data. Very often, they're relating this notion to ideas of quantity, to idea of velocity, of speed, of research. So you have all these different Vs that are associated to the notion of big data. And also, often, there is this idea that data actually are some sort of neutral fact that can be um, used and, and from which new knowledge can be extracted. And this is also at the basis of ideas about AI, artificial intelligence, which is as a sort of alternative to human interventions, where you're actually trying to uh, decide things based on data analysis, and you have these facts informing your analysis in a sort of neutral sense. So uh, my research is actually very, very critical of this position. And the reason, um, basically, and it does this, oh yeah, sorry. Um, by attacking this particular premise, the idea that data are neutral facts, and really thinking about what this may be. So, uh, as an alternative to this view, sorry, this is very austic. Okay, right. As an alternative to this view, um, I proposed to actually look at how data are being exchanged across different contexts and different fields. In fact, look at how big data are being mobilized, how they're being assembled, how do they travel between people who have very different backgrounds, skills, and expertise. And the philosophical outshot of actually doing this kind of empirical work, historically and through social science, is to have a much more informed view on the conditions under which data actually can yield knowledge, and in fact, really try and understand better what we mean by empirical research. So uh, to be able to do this, we are um, basically trying to think about what we call data journeys. How do data travel across different contexts? Um, how are they being mobilized? And this actually gives us a very, very nice window over the conditions under which data become knowledge. So how does that actually work? I'm really sorry. It's just not really working. OK, right. OK, so um, what we are doing is we are analyzing sites in which data are actually being created. And we are placing particular emphasis on sites in which data are being mobilized. And these uh, generally tend to be digitalized spaces nowadays, though we've also looked at um, kind of material types of data being circulated physically. But mostly, this will be done through different kinds of databases, uh, data infrastructures, data platforms, so on and so forth. And then we're looking at how data are being interpreted, uh, very often in sites that actually are distanced from the original sites uh, in which data were produced. And um, we're particularly focused on the idea that for, to go from sites in which data are being created to where they're being mobilized, data need to be de decontextualized somehow. You need to choose which properties of the data need to travel with them. And uh, by the time you get to reinterpret the data, you actually have to do a, a recontextualization ex exercise. You have to really think about which parts of the information I have about this data is relevant to me in my different context to be able to extract reliable knowledge from them. 
So we've done this in a variety of contexts. Uh, we look at what's going on, for instance, in particular institutions. This is a very complex exercise uh, you see here from the National Phenomics Institute in the UK, producing hundreds of thousands of images of plants to try and then extract knowledge about plant growth and development. Uh, we looked at it in uh, circumstances when data travel between species. So you collect, for instance, uh, genomic data from um, yeast, very humble organism, and then use it to uh, try and extract data about, uh, try and extract information and knowledge about um, cancer research in humans. Um, we've looked at what happens when you try and bring together lots of different data sets from different parts of medicine and different people who are working within medicine and looked at what the function is of activities such as securization of data and anonymizing data to actually really influence the ways in which we extract, again, knowledge and we make sense of the data. So breaking down, if you want, the boundary between the technical aspects of making data secure and actually providing tools through which we can interpret the data and concept through which we can do that. And we looked at very complex situations where you're trying to bring together data that come from climate, from biology, from um, um, from all sorts of from biomedicine, from different parts of research and different kinds of fields to try and understand complex phenomena even at the local level. So what have we learned through all of this? I think one of the key concepts that has come out from this kind of research is the idea that actually what counts as data throughout these travels changes. Not only does it change, but it changes really quite dramatically. So different people involved in mobilizing data across all these different stages actually tend to have very different ideas about what counts as data in the first place. And that has a profound effect on how data are then being manipulated, what is considered to be data at each stage of this journey, what is considered to be good data, what is considered to be irrelevant data or noise, right? And you can see that this will have an influence on how we then think about these neutral facts that are traveling around. So um, the implication here is to actually have a more relational idea of data, where data are not these kinds of objects that represent the world, but rather the objects that we produce in an exchange with the world, which is very humanly constructed, and we take them to be evidence for a particular claim at a particular time. And so in that sense, data are really defined in terms of their function within specific processes. Now, what does that mean? It means that, in fact, the same objects can or cannot be data depending on the people who are manipulating them and how they're actually deciding to construe them and to use them. And that also means that the procedures through which data are processed and ordered affect very strongly the ways in which data are being interpreted. So how do we think about uh, the process of research then? We can think about it in some way according to this graph where our knowledge really, our knowledge of the process of uh, knowledge production starts with our interactions with the world through which we produce objects which may or may not be processed as data, which are then ordered and clustered in ways that allow us to have models. And it is at this point that we're actually producing a representation of the world, not simply by producing objects that we treat as data. And through the analysis of these models, we then get knowledge that then again informs our um, future interactions with the world. So very briefly, what does that mean then? Why uh, thinking about data in this way? Why should we care, uh, really? Well, uh, first of all, recognizing that the fact that we can interpret the same data sets in very different ways is not a problem, as sometimes is, proposed to, is, is uh, presented as being, but it's in fact the very basis of research and of the idea that we can uh, repurpose different uh, pieces of information for different uses. Um, obviously, this is a view of data where the representational value is variable, is not intrinsic to the particular um, representation that they are, but it depends on which context you actually put them in. And things like what counts as raw data, what counts as data manipulation, what counts as reliable data also shift uh, depending on where data are being used. And just as a final remark, this also shifts our view of what we mean by theory. 
Um, so very often we're connected the DO theory with you know the kind of knowledge that we have extracted through these complex procedures. These are the claims that we're really uh, thinking about. Very often we think about it as propositional, right? Well, I think this kind of work shows that in fact there are theoretical components in different kinds of theories coming up, being produced, and being applied at different stages of this way of thinking about the research process. So uh, in my particular work, I've been looking a lot at the kind of theory that has been produced by ordering data, which is very different from thinking about theory as something that you produce as uh, the result of an hypothesis um, hypothesis-driven research, for instance, but also that you produce in a more theoretical sense without really thinking about these processes of uh, data engagement, if you want. So what does this framework actually account for? I think the key thing here is the idea of data intensive science as not being inductive in a naive sense. It's not just about trying to extract knowledge from data in a naive sense. But in fact, what we are doing is we are developing situations through which we can interpret the data. And of course, information technologies play a very important role in this, very often because they allow us to play with our imagination. Right? They allow us to create lots of different scenarios through which we can see what happens if we treat data differently. But also, what's really important here is to think that data and, in fact, databases, data platforms are not some sort of repository for ready-made facts uh, because it's the conditions under which the evidential value of this data is attributed to them that determine how data are then uh, moving in this system. And evidential value is affected by many other forms of value, which include affective value, economic value of the data, personal value, cultural value, and so on and so forth. So really, the history of data use as a history of um, data journeys is in fact a history of value in practice. It's a very human history of thinking about how do we provide value to these objects as they move around uh, various parts of our societies. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Bale. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here today, and, and I want to thank the Vese Bay, the, uh, the Volkswagen Foundation, the Falling Wallace Foundation, and particularly Elena Sandman, who I know helped to organize this event. Uh, so I was asked to discuss today how to cultivate creativity in an over-researched field, and I thought I would take the initiative to, to begin with a kind of provocative idea, perhaps, which is that perhaps we should begin by questioning common sense. Uh, my own research is about political polarization and, and social media. And, uh, you know, many of us have been quite surprised by events in the world in the past four or five years, such as the Brexit referendum, uh, the somewhat surprising election of Donald Trump, or if you like, in, in Germany, perhaps the rise of the alternative for Germany. And I think many of us have wondered whether social media plays a role, and specifically, by, of course, uh, perhaps trapping us within echo chambers or, if you like, filter bubbles, uh, which encourage us or allow us to self-segregate according to our political views. And so the story goes, uh, of course, uh, if we are only listening to our side and we don't listen to other perspectives, surely we will become hardened in our views and surely social media is going to only increase political polarization. So this is a very common sense idea. Uh, one that I myself was so seduced by uh, that I launched a multi-year uh, research agenda, actually four or five year research agenda, to try to study this issue. And as I did so, I discovered that common sense is, is more like a maze uh, than, than anything else. Um, when we ask a child or when we're asked by a child about something that's common sense, it's really revealing. You know, the things that go into making something shared knowledge are really deeply sociological, and that's my discipline, sociology. And you know, when we think about what makes something common sense, we're forced to articulate some of the most basic premises. In my case, what is an echo chamber? What, you know, what is political polarization? Specifically, what is an algorithm? And so on and so forth. 
And in so doing, I think, or at least I began to realize that um, often it's this undefinable or unspeakable content um, that makes common sense unassailable. Um, you know, we have so much focus on shared consensus that we really lose the kind of basic building blocks that go into making um, our knowledge shared. There's a lot of other reasons why we, we seldom research common sense. For example, funders don't have a, you know, if you've ever asked for money to, to study common sense, you might find yourself uh, with an uphill struggle, right? Surely we already know this. Of course, social media algorithms are to blame for, for polarizing us. Why not spend your money on something else? Maybe the, the, the latest uh, AI technique, right? Um, other reasons why, maybe they're politically convenient. Uh, if we were you know, surprised by the election of, of Trump or su surprised by the Brexit referendum, you know, perhaps this idea tidily explains the problem um, and, and we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't proceed. Or you know, perhaps common sense is just very difficult to study. So if you imagine trying to isolate the effect of a social media filter bubble or an echo chamber, what would you like to do as a scientist? You would like to take someone into a room and lock them there for, say, two weeks and fully control what they see, right? Take away their phone, give them a different phone. It would be deeply unethical, logistically impossible, and so on and so forth. And so studying common sense, I think, there's numerous obstacles from funding to execution to logistics. And in our lab, which is called the Polarization Lab, which is a multidisciplinary group of researchers at Duke University, we devised a field experiment to try to test this common wisdom. And so in November 2017, which was approximately 4,000 years ago in COVID years, we, uh, we recruited about 1,600 Republicans and Democrats to complete a survey about their views. We asked them a range of questions about things like climate change, uh, racial inequality, uh, social inequality, and so on. Then one week later, we invited them to follow a bot that our research team created, which would, unbeknownst to them, expose them to 24 messages a day from the other political party. Uh, so Republicans saw a series of messages from Democrats, and Democrats who agreed to uh, follow these bots saw a, uh, a series of messages from conservatives. We used a variety of techniques to see whether they were paying attention. Uh, we showed them a variety of uh, cute animal pictures and then uh, monitored whether they could identify these cute animal pictures. And then over the course of the month, we also collected a voluminous amount of data. We collected millions of tweets and their daily slices of their social network. And these were all linked to this longitudinal um, uh, survey data. And finally, one month later, we simply administered the same survey. We asked them the same questions and tried to answer the question, uh, what is the effect of stepping outside one's echo chamber? Surely everyone should become more moderate, right? If the, if the wisdom, if the common wisdom is right. Uh, we've heard this common wisdom echoing from the chambers of the European Parliament to the British Parliament to the American Parliament to Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, to Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook. So surely if we take people outside their echo chamber, it's common sense that they should become more moderate. Wrong. Here we're seeing uh, the effects of stepping outside one's echo chamber among a very large group of Democrats and Republicans who are paid to do so. So if they move to the right, they're becoming more conservative. And if they move to the left, I'm using American terminology here, um, they become more liberal, more in line with the Democratic Party. So Democrats did not become more moderate. They did not become slightly more conservative when we uh, fed them a new f news feed for one month uh, containing Republican content. And Republicans did not become more democratic when we fed them a month of Democratic content. Instead, both sides, especially Republicans, but also slightly uh, to the left, moved Democrats. And so, you know, this was a, a big research revelation for us. Um, we spent the, 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 the next three or four years opening a, an entirely new series of revelations, um, really discovering that it's not so much the algorithm per se, but the way that our human instincts to seek status and to develop identities that make us feel good about ourselves and the interplay between these two things, um, which really helped to understand, help us explain how and why political polarization is unfolding on social media today. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Russia, for this wonderful introduction and Falling Walls for this very diverse um, scientific organization. We don't have such diversity in many places. Thank you, David, for asking me to take out my... And Volkswagen Foundation and Vesebe for supporting such uh, wonderful initiatives. Um, today we're going to talk about um, an emergence of a new economic space, crypto space, crypto economies. And um, we're going to look at first transformation of fiat currency. There are many money forms, as sociologist Viviana Zelzar showed, but only three when it comes to fiat currency. 500 BC, oops, sorry, moves by itself. All right, 500 BC, this is Lydian money, it's metal money, came out where my mom lives in Anatolia right now, 60 kilometers away, away from it. Two euros is this technology, we're still using it. This is uh, Kubilai Han's paper money that came out around 13th century, mostly plagiarized by Chinese previous technologies. And um, as you know, Kubilai Han, Genghis Khan's grandson, and Genghis Khan comes from the song in 1979 that Western, West Germany, West Germany's Eurovision contest is, you know? And um, many, many years later, in 2009, a new money form emerged. This is first a data money. Its material is different, all right? There are many ways. This is cryptocurrency, the first cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin. All right, a um, lot of people talk about cryptocurrency as digital currency. It's not a good idea, because when you send your money from HSBC and HSBC account to another, you digitize metal and paper money already by data in processes that Sabina very, very nicely uh, showed us. Cryptocurrency is data money. It's not merely digital because we monetize data sending rights. This is a new material. So when I send Bitcoin to you, what I monetize is the right to send this data um, privately. However, it's very difficult to send it and even impossible. Why? I can take a picture of what I send and send it to someone else. First, I send to Susanna and then to Christopher and you can double send. What makes it possible is this new accounting system that we call blockchain. It gives shape and uniqueness to digital things. What a cup for water is time for digital things. Without a cup, water is everywhere. You can't drink it, you can't use it, right? Without time and without um, blockchain, you cannot make this possible. So with blockchain, we are now monetizing the right to send data and a new economy is emerging from that material new service. It is material, but intangible. A lot of people misunderstand it by thinking that, oh, digital things are new things, they are not material. First, there were atoms, now there is digital. This is like TED Talkish simplicity. It doesn't work that way. We are talking about intangible materialities that have material orders, like the very distribution of these chairs distributed your bodies materially. It was not an idea, an architectural idea. It, was, it had a material um, consequence in our lives. All right. Um, so what do we learn from that? Um, the blockchain is um, producing a new order in our world, a new way of making money, and this also creates a possibility of a new economization process. All right? In a recent paper that I published in Sociologica, thanks to Elena and David's wonderful editing, I showed that it is wrong to think that platforms like cryptocurrency platforms are multi-sided markets. They are not only markets. Plus, markets are very complex organizational spaces that we need to spend a new kind of energy to understand. So trying to regulate platforms as, as if they are 
um, just a multi-sided or a two-sided market that is the subject of two Nobel Economics Prize winners is not only wrong, but also wrong-headed, because you cannot regulate them if you think that they are markets. We now empirically know that they go beyond marketization relations. If um, we can, for instance, take a look at those relations that are, um, that are, that's going very fast without me moving it. It's very interesting. It, the infrastructural problems, I love that. It's, it's really nice, actually. We can just, you know, follow its order instead of my, my, my own order. This is a back. This is nice. It's really nice that when, it, when technology doesn't work in Germany, you feel like you're a human being. Um, um, that's fine. It's fine. Um, so let's, let's follow its order. Um, this is f what is to be done. What is to be done? OK? Um, firstly, um, we need to study materiality of economic things. Second, if you look at platforms like a cryptocurrency exchange or Amazon, don't think that they are mere markets. They create on a new form of economization principle. Because they work on those principles, you cannot have competition law to think about it. If I may show you a picture of a, this is a picture that I, that I did with a number of designers. This is how a platform works. The market exchange only happens here. Here, here is arbitration, here is banking, here is software production, gift exchange, and barter exchange. And they are all related to each other with forms of data flows which are economized further. So as public, we need to be, we are already contributing to the production of these links Whereas the corporation who controls the platform takes it. So we need to think about a new regulation principle. Not only that, a new taxation instrument. We only use money right now to tax. This is like we're in 13th century. Genghis Khan, granddaughter, grandson, um, came up with a new money form, paper money. Everyone is exchanging paper money. And the state is like, I want only metal money. We're like, I want only paper money or it's digital. You can't do that. So our regulation, regulative and a, a theoretical approach to economization relations should be on par in rapport with what's going on in the world. You may ask, come on, it's just cryptocurrency. This is not only cryptocurrency, because we're talking about first an economy, which is, it was like $2.6 trillion. Um, this is like seventh largest right now in the world, if you imagine it as a national economy. And this is the future of our economic relations. However, not as a form of replacing the previous one. As historians show that usually we live in relations of hybridization. So my research also showed that cryptocurrency trade has been supporting dollarization and euroization. It is not replacing previous forms of money. We're using metal, we're using paper, and now we're using data money. It is changing us as we changed it. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot uh, to our three speakers for their fascinating insights. Right, Karai, you can stay here, and I would ask Sabina and Chris to join us. So I think the idea is that we have two people there, one person there, fantastic. Yeah, thanks again for these inspiring insights. And I think we can already find first um, interconnections between what you have been saying. So while the audience thinks about questions and um, comments, I'll just try to, to, to see where there I, th I think you already also see connections, but I'll just try and um, d draw some. So, Sabina, um, data, how does data, I, I was wondering, as you, as you were showing us the cycle of data, how data turns into common, yeah, that's a great idea, how um, data turns into common sense, because it is so often used as a backup or as a sort of justification for what we consider common sense, but as you've shown us, this is a very complex cycle and a very it, which 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 has pitfalls at every given point right and um then with what you have shown us Korea is also 
how long-term developments of what is considered data um, yeah, lead, lead to um, new, new forms of, of, of exchange, new forms of societal um, interrelations. And um, also what I um, loved about what you were saying is I think one could so go back to Marx and, 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 and talk about is, is, is money really intangible because already paper money was supposed was thought to be intangible and so different from the barter exchange system. So, so how is this now adding to this? But um, more importantly, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, yeah, in the back. Could we have a microphone? Maybe you can briefly say who you are, and that would be great. Hi, I'm uh, Modisri Mukherjee. I'm a senior editor at Scientific American. So my question is for uh, Professor Khalis Khan. Um, you talk about cryptocurrency as being the future of economic relations. Can you tell us something about the energy consumption of cryptocurrency and whether the expansion of this currency is compatible with efforts to combat climate change? This is a very good question. Um, cryptocurrencies do not consume energy. Their accounting systems do, like blockchains. And we are witnessing three generations of blockchains right now. Bitcoin is a very old blockchain, and it burns a lot of energy. Ethereum is a younger blockchain that consumes less energy. And blockchains like Avalanche, is super efficient, very easy to run uh, uh, blockchains, and they don't burn a lot of energy. You can actually mine and control with a, with a laptop at your home, whereas for Bitcoin, it's huge. This is like, think about technology. Um, you may perhaps remember something called Commodore 64 that was very important in our houses. So we're talking about like then the future of Commodore 64. There was no future for Commodore 64. All right? I don't think, technologically speaking, Bitcoin is going to be with us. It's blockchain. However, the cryptocurrency may stay as an asset, but we are already beyond uh, blockchains, um, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain. Second thing that my research showed is that currently research shows that market exchange platforms are replacing blockchains. 88% of Bitcoin exchange has been uh, registered uh, last year on as a custodian asset in the exchange platform and not necessarily written on blockchain. Thank you. Thanks for the question and for the answer. So I see no one else um, at the moment with the question. So I would actually ask our panelists maybe to briefly reply to each other's um, talk. So maybe Sabina, would you like to jump in and, and comment on what you've heard from Korai and Chris? Thank you. Yeah, so it was extremely useful and interesting. Thank you very much for both of you. And I was wondering, so I suppose um, one of the key parts of my work has been also more and more you know, political end of it, um, has been to shift the focus to some extent from the technology itself um, to the processes of curation and you know, actually processing of the data. Right, so basically moving away from the um, surface of digital platforms and looking at some of the mechanisms through which these are uh, then constituted, which then brings you immediately to think about the governance of some of these issues. And I was very interested in the fact that you immediately point into this also, uh, Korai, and I guess it's also like, you know, implied in a lot of the work that you've been doing, Chris. So I was wondering, how do you think that um, refocusing like not so much away from the technology per se, because our work is completely informed by our understanding of how the technology works, but on these processes of production, in, a, in a, actually quite a Marxist sense, I would say. Um, how is that affecting how you see your work going forward? I mean, especially maybe you know, in Korai's sense, you know, you were pointing to the fact that you know legislation and governance is so slow in following up on this technology. But what does, what would it mean for you? Um, for these processes to shift and accelerate and, and become more compatible with what we're, we're doing. And similarly, in terms of the uh, bubble chambers and eco chambers, I mean, how do you move away from that particular way of framing uh, the problem and thinking differently about social media? Yeah, I'll take a stab at it. I, I think um, 
you know, I think we're suffering from big data hubris right now. You know, we have this expectation because machine learning can drive a car or, you know, efficiently hide uh, currency uh, that it, surely it should be able to figure out human behavior, you know. Um, but I think as, as, you know, both of your projects show and, and certainly some, some of my research shows, you know, um, we're very far from the point where machine learning will predict human behavior reliably, I think. And even worse, we've we've come to rely on the kind of digital traces left behind on on places like social media platforms, and we infer from those things like political beliefs, which are of course much more deeper and complex. And so, in my own research, even though I've um, you know using the tools of kind of computational social science, um, this project that I described actually took us to qualitative interviews uh, because we realized how much was left out of the digital record, and indeed. The major revelations came from understanding the gap between the the digital representation and the offline representation. So, I absolutely agree that you know we need we need to think more about the production process instead of uh, of taking these things as you know an, an unedited transcript of human behavior. I agree. Things are changing. One of the things that we're seeing, thanks to data materialities that are um, related to relations of power representation and theory is that we are now stacking our relationships. Uh, platforms are stacked economization relationships that can change actor network device and representation configurations. That's why, that's why we need to be using a more dynamic actor-based approach to those relations. Marxism doesn't help us for that. My, my heart is Marxist. All right, I love him. But his analytical stance in a dialectical thinking of, of, of differentiating relations of production and exchange doesn't work. Um, empirically doesn't work, theoretically it's a dead end. So we need to learn, for instance, um, sociologists have shown that markets are produced on the ground. So in Marx, you don't see that. Markets are there. So it's, he has an underdeveloped understanding of markets, an overdeveloped understanding of production processes. So and he, if he lived right now, he would be looking at things like you do, I think. Um, because he, we have been helped by a progress in social research. And um, it fine-tuned our analysis better. Chris's work is fantastic. I looked at, for instance, Twitter data, 360,000 followers and all their interactions. We're talking about, this is very big data. It's, it's, it takes like six weeks to only download from Twitter. You put a fire hose. And then what you show is that you know, people, this is in Sociologica, also published, and also in Jour a British Journal of Sociology coming up next issue. We show that power in Twitter, representational power, has nothing to do with a power in a cryptocurrency community. They didn't know. And the people in cryptocurrency community didn't know that they didn't have power in Twitter. So it seems like big data is important, but we need to be careful, as you invited us, um, to think about where does it come from? How is it produced? Who uses it? What does it reflect? Very much like, I think our findings are very much in rapport with each other. And uh, against the, the lot of people around us who's telling us that, firstly, you reached out to ethnography. You showed us data is a representational political universe. So you need to look at this. And my work in those new economic formations show us that if this is the case, then we need to change regulation and taxation pra practices. Thank you, Korai. I think um, what we have learned already is that data is not neutral, um, although it creates this um, belief or it, 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 it leads to this misconception, but um, it is always political. And um, we have seen that um, in, in all these three papers. I would like to ask the audience to get involved and don't be too shy. There is a question in the back. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm uh, Robert Gore. I'm a postdoc at the Vitsi Bay. I just wanted to follow up on that last question and maybe just broaden it very, very slightly because I think um, if I took Professor Leonelli's um, argument, 
maybe we can expand it and say it's not just like data that is that is political but also research itself right especially when we're talking about these kinds of research angles which are really on the frontier of governance regulation and i think it's you know i've i've been involved on the periphery of some projects that look at these questions right of of political polarization for example social media regulation and it's not possible, unfortunately, to be like an impartial kind of entrant into this debate because there's so much industry funding. There's so much, um, I guess, political kind of stakes on the line, right? And, and unfortunately, for better or for worse, like how do we engage in that, I guess, um, if we're trying to, on one hand, kind of provide, you know, shatter some of these common sense myths, um, which oftentimes, and we can talk about this, right, we're kind of lofted out by public intellectuals 20 years ago, um, you know, Eli Pariser throws out the filter bubble idea and then comm scholars are spending 20 years trying to figure out what's happening. Um, so, you know, engaging on, I guess, the social media side um, where there's so much at stake and maybe also connecting to the last presentation, also something like, um, you know, digital currencies. I was, I was wondering whether you're familiar with um, David Columbia's work and how you might respond to this idea of, you know, Bitcoin as a right wing political project. And this idea that at its at its core, it's actually about subverting the infrastructures of the state. You can go back to the early, even before Bitcoin, right? David Chom and like the early hackers in the 80s. DigiCash, I would maybe say, is the first cryptocurrency. Um, and it was all about anonymity online. And it was all about basically an anarchist ideology. So I guess these things are all entangled. And I wonder how you position your research within this kind of hyper politicized environment. Thank you. These were actually two questions, but you, you brought them together you, you, in, in, in your final uh, remark already quite well. Um, Chris, would you like to say something to that first? Sure. Yeah, you, right. it, I think it's a great point. You know, it, it's, it's often unspoken in our, in our scholarly communities. I think the big challenge, though, is to ask what what if we don't what if we say nothing as scholars? And, you know, I was recently invited to a kind of high profile meeting of U.S. elected officials who are discussing how to regulate social media. And the meeting began with a viewing of a docudrama uh, that's a popular Netflix film. Um, and this was to set the stage for the entire conversation. Um, you know, this is the alternative. So, so surely I think we need to be involved. Um, I worry too that if, if uh, people try to implement or, 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 or even worse, legislate after these types of Unproven and, and often untested interventions. You know, not uh, there, there's many in the case of social media. I'm sure there's many in, in the other cases as well. Um, you know, we, we, we will we will not be happy with the outcome. Uh, so I think you know it, it's it's a call for more public scholarship, a call for for uh, for us to and, and there's of course a path I think that's in between these two. Surely, as you said, there's funding issues. There's but but surely we can present evidence you know, as impartially as we can. And that will at least be better than the docudramas. Yeah. Thank you. Cry, you want to? Say yeah, um, great question. But we live in the second generation, second decade of cryptocurrencies. And cryptocurrency exchange relations take space in seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Instead of institutional memory building, we're talking about 45 years of exchange because conventional markets are open only 37 hours a week. Right? So it is a lot of experience, and this new generation is different. For instance, if I don't know whether you saw in the presentation that went ahead of us, ahead of me, um, that in this cryptocurrency community, which was chosen as the best cryptocurrency community by a very popular journal, we saw 75% um, of these 20,000 people keep only 22% of their all monies in cryptocurrency. So we're talking about, you know, you know, teachers, we're talking about middle class, we're talking about young people, old people, we're talking about us. So this early generation disappeared. It was like 0.1% of people who used it like 12 years ago. Now we are talking about a mass adoption. Um, another sociologist calls this pop finance. So it, this is like popularization of everyday finance. Uh, I have an 11 year old son, he has AVAX. And um, so we, this is like the first generation and the work of David Columbia. I think he's right. 
I was in Virginia two days ago. I sent an email actually to him. Um, and, um, but it was a historical piece now. Contemporary communities are very different. And there is another um, a finding of my research that was very alarming in that cryptocurrency community. I asked them, um, I see a lot of men they seem to be white and Western. Is this all? And there's like, no, they're not. There's a lot of women. And I was like, and then I asked them, what is the percentage of women in your community? And the average is, average is 40 to 45 percent. The answer, in reality, it's 96.3 percent men. 75 percent coming from Western countries, not OECD Western. And 65% has a BA or MA. So we're talking about white, men, Western, and well-educated people dominating. So there are relations of power, but it's not about anarcho or whatever. We're talking about middle class, you know, um, elite uh, centers of power that we can clearly observe right now in the second decade in these decentralized communities. Yeah. So thank you very much. Great question, of course. Um, I guess the thing that has been worrying me more and more over the year and has now completely re, re channeled my work has been this consideration that, you know, philosophically speaking, there is no owning data. The whole concept has been disintegrating, like because of the type of technology, because of digitalization, all these kinds of things. And yet, what we have observed over the years is that there is basically no data processing without some process of data appropriation. And that this process of data appropriation are indeed, as Korai was already pointing out, completely owned very often by a very, very, very specific elite uh, with very particular ideologies attached to it. And so, my response to these considerations has been to refocus my work more and more on this ideology of openness, communication, and transparency, which seems to permeate um, this world as you know, a positive thing, something that we can now do. Technology helps us to communicate better instantaneously, link the whole world, and problematize it hugely. So the work that we're doing uh, going forward is, for instance, questioning these notions around open science and particularly open data as something which is actually a democratizing uh, force. It can be in very specific, very limited examples, but what we're finding is that actually because the structures and infrastructures that make this possible have, an, have been appropriated in such a very specific way, in fact, like when you're looking at what's happening on the ground, open data are not open at all. And, the, and selling them as open is become a very big problem at the moment. So, you know, I think hopefully there's something that research can do, even basic research like the one I do, to try and really challenge these big conceptualizations. But then, yeah, what then happens in the world is uh, that's another story. Thank you. I think, too, what we have seen here is that there are these labels like open data, democratization, but in the end, what is behind it is highly manipulatable or manipulated. So um, your research is so important to, like you said, to make it transparent and to break through these walls that tend to cluster knowledge in for, for certain parts of the society, and as we know, knowledge is power. Um, we have a question in the back, and I think that's our final question before we go into a very short break. Hello, my name is David Stark. A question for Sabina. So Sabina, you talked about these problems of open science, where data collected in one field, contextualized, et cetera, because of open science now becomes available to people from, for example, very different fields, or maybe like not operating in any specific field at all. Like they're, I, or let's say, for example, they are physicists who feel that any field that produces data, they have a, a, a particular ability to analyze it. So as more and more projects are using data that's produced by other fields with their contextualized knowledge, what do you expect will happen? Will science become more diverse or will it become less diverse uh, as people who are not specialized have access to all this stuff, but they don't have the specific knowledge? Which, so which, which way is it likely to go? 
Thank you very much, David. Very provocative question, of course. Um, so I think it's very difficult to cash it out as less or more diverse. I think what is happening now is we're seeing a wave of work like in data science, which is a field that's very close to my heart. I've been working with these people for, for a long time. Uh, that I started off thinking that this was a domain neutral exercise. We could have been applied in, in lots of different areas. And the beauty of it was trying to bring these technical tools, no matter what the contextualization of the data would have been like. And I think that has worked in a very, very first wave. So look at these big data mashups, for instance, that I've been analyzing. Um, what can we see in a very superficial way about certain you know, preliminary correlations we can spot by doing this kind of studies? We can say quite a few things. They're very interesting. We can spot gaps in knowledge, for instance, these kinds of things. The moment the questions become a little bit deeper and start to, for instance, bring in notions of causality and what actually is the cause of something, what is the effect, like how are we really relating um, these, these different concerns and issues and things and phenomena. That's where usually I've seen that kind of more superficial domain agnostic approach break down. Because at that moment, you really do start to question how is it that you're recontextualizing this data and how exactly you're interpreting, say, information about their provenance, where they're coming from, information about which semantic system has been used to uh, process them, for instance, through databases, and so on and so forth. And who actually can make sense of this and who can't. Um, so I think. In that sense, I'm hoping at least we're going towards a world where domain expertise, and in fact, domain expertise that goes well beyond the realms of professional science, will and should become more and more relevant and more recognized. Because without that kind of expertise, we really cannot get any deeper into make sense of these kinds of uh, forests of data that we are, that we are looking at. Uh, but of course, yeah, uh, we'll have to see whether that happens. I mean, that depends on the kind of economic and political structures that Chris and Coraya are looking at. On this optimistic note, uh, let us thank our speakers again. Um, thanks a lot. So, I think it's time to get on to the second panel. Hello to everyone who has joined us. And um, hello to everyone who has stayed. Very ha glad you did so. So, after this first um, inspiring panel that really went um, very well and all three talks um, really gelled, um, I'm curious about the next, our next panel with our next three speakers, um, Sven Beckert from Harvard University, Elena Esposito and Dilip Menon. And we keep the same order and the same format. We first hear the three statements and then go on to the discussion. So Sven, I pass it on to you. Okay, good morning. Uh, great to see all of you here. Um, I'm supposed to speak about how to um, organize a research project that takes a long time. Oh, no, do we? Okay. That takes a long time, uh, and how to keep a focus and how to keep attention to a project that is difficult and, uh, and long lasting. And I thought the best way to do that is to talk about the research that I'm currently engaged in and that I have been engaged in for a few years, namely a big research project on the global history of capitalism. Of course, uh, most of us, almost all of us, feel that we in some ways understand capitalism because uh, all of us, presumably, except for our visitors from North Korea, live in capitalist societies and, uh, and have uh, spent their lives uh, living in, in, a, in a world which was very much structured by the logic uh, of capitalism. But uh, so we, we take it for granted that we acquire our subsistence on markets. Uh, we take it for granted that we sell our labor power in markets unless we employ people who have to do so. Uh, we take it for granted that there's a high degree of division of labor. Uh, we take it for granted, as we just heard, that money structures economic relationships, it structures almost all economic relationships, and we also take it for granted that we live in a world of almost continuous economic growth. I mean, I understand that sometimes that economic growth is not unfolding as it's supposed to, but, but if we look at it from a long historical perspective, we live in a world that shows uh, an unusual, a dramatically different pattern of economic development than all of previous human history before. Ironically, though, it is often the word in which we live, the word that we take for granted, 
is often the word that is most uh, difficult to understand because in some ways uh, uh, capitalism uh, seems to us like the air that we breathe and therefore uh, uh, not easily uh, comprehended. As a historian, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make what seems normal, that's what seems natural, to make that seem strange. And I'm inspired in this by a Belgian artist, by a terrific Belgian artist by the name of Martin von den Einde, who looks at the present day world from the perspective of an archaeologist in the long future, like a several thousand years from here, from now. And here's a beautiful project he did. This is a cup he purchased at Ikea, and he smashed it, and he assembled it with the tools of archaeologists. And in some ways, I'm trying to look at capitalism from a perspective of the very far future. How would future uh, historians uh, look at this weird and strange civilization that we inhabit and that seems uh, so natural uh, to all of us. So in a nutshell, I'm working on a book that will uh, try to come to terms with the history of capitalism during the past 500 years on a global scale. It is uh, a long durée history dealing with a very long time period and it's a history that is, uh, it is global. And in some ways, one of the basic arguments of, of the project is that we can understand that capitalism and the world we live in today only from this long durée perspective and from, the perspective of, and from a global uh, perspective. Uh, the project is uh, basically guided by three questions. Uh, how did capitalism emerge and why did it emerge when and where it did? How did this capitalism change over time? And what are the characteristics of this uh, capitalism? Of course, as all of you know very well, there have been many people who have been thinking about parts of this project. No? Oh, sure. Not those people. And uh, you might recognize some of those. Uh, I think, except for one, they are dead. Um, but uh, but, but it, it, it seems like that in the year 2021, um, we have uh, an opportunity to rethink some of these ideas. You know, Adam Smith's idea of border being uh, natural, or Karl Marx's idea that all history is a history of class struggle. We have an opportunity in the year 2021 to understand, re reinterpret this long history of capitalism. And partly, I think this possibility of reinterpreting this uh, history of capitalism is thanks to uh, the end of the Cold War, which made it very difficult uh, to have conversations on capitalism. And second also, because we uh, live in a much more globally connected world and thus intuitively I think we understand much better that this history of capitalism is a global history that can only be understood from this perspective. So I'm trying to understand this history of capitalism, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 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 from a global perspective. Much of our thinking of capitalism has been quite Eurocentric. Uh, indeed, the histories that many of us tell about capitalism, that many of us believe about capitalism, is one of the most Eurocentric narratives of all of, uh, of all that we still uh, tell. Uh, and this goes is true across the political spectrum. So uh, here you see what, what would be a typical starting point for the history of capitalism, namely the Medici in uh, Renaissance Florence. Uh, other people start the history of capitalism, let's say, in the 1640s, in the 17th century, uh, the, the Netherlands. Uh, others would, uh, from a Marxist perspective, would look at the history of uh, capitalism and its origins from the perspective of the British countryside and its enclosures. Uh, and yet others would look at the history of capitalism starting uh, with the history of, uh, of, of industrialization. I believe that this is... Uh, a complete misreading of capitalism's history, and it is, un and it is untenable in a world in which, uh, like today, uh, so much of the most significant developments in capitalism take place not on this continent, not in the old world, but take place in places such as um, uh, China, Nigeria, or Brazil, or elsewhere. Uh, this is also historically the case, and, um, and when, when we think about capitalism, I'm trying to uh, make, uh, make, uh, help us understand how things such as Caribbean uh, sugar plantations, such as here in Antigua, 
uh, how uh, merchant communities in parts of the world that are not Europe, here you see 17th century Surat in India, uh, how uh, proto-industrialization in many different parts of the world, and also, of course, how the uh, modern manufacturing, such as here, Korean core workers, uh, how they play a part in uh, the history of capitalism. And the basic argument is that, uh, that capitalism is not just global, and this is kind of a neat story that shows us how different parts of the world are connected to one another, but I'm arguing that the very core of capitalism and the dynamics of capitalism is exactly these kinds uh, of global uh, uh, connections. The second main finding of this project so far is that the interconnectedness uh, of capitalism points uh, to another fundamental characteristic of capitalism, namely its diversity. So it's not a process of making the world ever more homogeneous, but a world that, uh, that rests uh, on, on, on diversity. And uh, this is just one example for this diversity. Uh, when you think about labor under capitalism, most of us will think as wage labor as the primary form of labor under capitalism. Uh, but historically and into the present world, we see that there are very different kinds of labor that, uh, that, that power the capitalist revolution. And here you see uh, wage workers, indentured servants, enslaved workers, and household labor, all of which I'm arguing is and continues to be, this diversity continues to be one of the animating forces of the capitalist revolution. And such diversity is also important uh, in terms of uh, territorial regimes, how capitalism is territorially organized, and how capitalism is uh, the, 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 the politics of uh, uh, and the political regimes in which capitalism is embedded also shows a great degree uh, of diversity. And the diversity is exactly what, uh, what, uh, what animates capitalism. And in some ways, capitalism is much less dogmatic Capitalism is rather undogmatic and much less dogmatic than many of the people who have tried to uh, interpret it as. The third uh, major uh, part of this project is that, um, that I'm writing the history of capitalism not from the perspective just of vast structures, impersonal structures, but I'm writing this uh, history of capitalism from the perspective of a whole range of different actors. Uh, so uh, in that history, for example, we feature merchants from 17th century China. Uh, we feature uh, uh, women workers protesting in Buenos Aires in the early 20th century against uh, their living conditions. Uh, I feature industrialists like this guy who was sentenced for war crimes, not just in one war, but in two, World War I and World War II. That must be a record. And, uh, and uh, uh, people like this, the revolutionary workers of Saint-Domingue, and indeed one of the arguments in the book is that the revolution on Saint-Domingue was one of the most important events in the global history of, uh, of capitalism. Uh, partly, um, uh, and, and I've also featured people like uh, state actors like this colonial official in French West Africa who travels into what is now the Senegalese hinterland. Uh, this picture points to another uh, major finding of this project, namely that we need to think about the state when we think about capitalism. Uh, all too often, uh, many people, probably not in this crowd, but in the larger public, think about the state and about capitalism as almost two kind of contradictory uh, structures. But, uh, but when we look at the long history of capitalism, we clearly see that the state is constitutive of capitalism. In some ways, uh, we cannot think about this capitalism without the state. And what we heard about money, for example, is also, I think, a point uh, that, that the, the, the importance of the state in structuring monies is, is important in that story. And uh, fifth and last, um, where is this? Fifth and large, uh, last, I, um, I, I argue that, uh, that when we think about capitalism, it is important to think about the countryside. I mean, most people, when they think about capitalism, think about cities and think about industry. But, uh, but when you look at the 500 years global history of capitalism, you see that many of the revolutions of capitalism actually took place in the countryside and in agriculture and therefore uh, need, to, uh, need to feature uh, prominently in our thinking uh, about, uh, about uh, capitalism. Uh, of course, most fundamentally, what I'm trying to do is to denaturalize uh, capitalism 
to understand that this is a very particular and peculiar form of organizing economic life, much different of other forms of economic life that have existed on planet Earth. And in some ways, that has implications for the contemporary world, because I think in the end, it does show that the world we inhabit is not a world that is uh, created by forces, you know, the, uh, the natural forces, but it's, but it's created by, um, by, by humans, by human interventions, uh, by, of course, by human conflict with one another. And, uh, and I think in some ways, even though the history of capitalism is often a rather dire history, but it does also show the possibilities of us shaping the future. And in that way, I find this investigation of a long history also to be empowering in thinking about our presence. Also, what I mentioned earlier, that capitalism can take on very many different forms and thus is, uh, is, is certainly a system of organizing economic life that is itself also uh, amendable to, uh, to uh, human intervention and to, and, to, and to change. So to come back to the issue at the, that I mentioned at the beginning, namely how do you motivate yourself to do something like this? How do you keep attention on a project such as this for, uh, for uh, quite a few years? Um, I think what is, uh, what is, what is really uh, crucial is what happens at the very beginning of engaging in such work, namely to find something that matters, that matters both in academic discourses, but also matters uh, to the world at large, that, that you as a researcher have the sense that, uh, that what your work, even though it's often very lonely, and you spend countless days, weeks, and months, and perhaps years, in, as in my case, in archives and in libraries, but, uh, but, 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 uh, but you need, it, it is helpful to know that what you do has an impact, uh, 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 perhaps, or is at has at least a relevance to the world in which uh, we, we, we live in. And, um, and once you do that, I think you need to be humble. You need to maintain a curiosity. You need to maintain a sense that you are yourself in a process uh, of constant uh, learning. And uh, you need to allow yourself to be surprised that things are different than you thought they would be and uh, and 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 to try to figure it out as you uh, as 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 you go along but um, but i think that all is a, an extremely rewarding process and you know we live in a world in which not that many people have the opportunity to spend their days and years uh, reading and thinking about uh, such problems and so we should also appreciate that we have that privilege to be able to read, to write, and to have conversations such as the one we have right here and now. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sven. Um, I think, Elena, if you would come up next. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me? Uh, thanks a lot for organizing this amazing summit, and I'm really happy and honored to be here. Uh, but I have to say what I'm presenting here will be slightly different from what I heard from my colleagues, from whom I really learned a lot. But I have to say uh, I, the difference will be I don't have a PowerPoint. And the reason is that I, instead of presenting my research, I took seriously the question that we got from Moritz, where is Moritz, which I find extremely interesting and puzzling uh, in preparation for this summit. So I read the question I got so I understand how I'm going to um, organize my little talk here. So he asked this question to me, how can researchers cultivate pers perseverance and a long-term perspective as they conduct multifaceted research that is centered on one particular topic or question? which is a puzzling question. I think it's interesting for the way each of us organizes um, its own research projects. And it was particularly puzzling for me because it led me to think about what I've been doing uh, for many decades. How do we understand perseverance? And do I, I am, am I a model of perseverance? Uh, it depends how you understand it. And at first sight, I'm actually not. Because uh, if you think about perseverance, uh, you usually think about research that per pursue the same research topic for many decades. It can be in some cases, be the, or in many cases, the um, topic of the uh, PhD dissertation or 
something they developed after that, on which they become more and more expert, more and more solid. Uh, and at the end, uh, they are recognized uh, reference points their community, and they can develop solid, uh, well-grounded research, which has many advantages, of course, uh, for career, of course, but also for the uh, quality of the research project they are developing. Then I looked at what I've been doing in the, um, well, many decades of researchers now, and uh, actually, I did the opposite, because I've been working on a variety of uh, apparently completely unrelated issues. Uh, I've been working on memory and forgetting, I've been working on finance, uh, I've been working on um, fashion for many years, on the meaning of fiction, on probability and algorithms, and uh, um, well, the project I presented here at Falling Walls, uh, the current project, is about uh, um, algorithmic prediction. Um, so it could be hardly be a more diverse list of, of topics. Um, so I thought, but clearly, I've been addressing different topics every couple of years and changing from one to the other. Um, what does it mean in terms of perseverance? Do I have to understand myself as a person lacking perseverance? Or maybe um, we can we talk about a different way of understanding and practicing perseverance in the scientific research? Uh, and I would argue, and that is what I propose for the discussion here in our little meeting maybe, that uh, we can talk about two ways of understanding perseverance, and uh, especially of the relationship between perseverance and coherence. And my impression is that we have, there can be two ways to understand it. Uh, I would say a kind of perseverance or coherence a priori, when you present, you organize your research, and the kind of perseverance a posteriori that you discover afterwards. Um, and in that sense, uh, this coherence a posteriori is something that happens when you look back at your research and you find that there's something linking your topics uh, in a way that maybe is more compatible with chance or with what now uh, it's fashion to talk serendipity. So it's a different way of organizing the, the, the um, well, leading question of your research. And then coming back to my case, not because it's my case, but it's an example of a, a possible way of understanding perseverance in research over um, several years, then look back at my so diverse topics, and I, I have the impression that I can find a coherence that I can find now, not when I chose the topic I was working on, because I said, I work on memory and forgetting, and memory and forgetting are relating, which I would say is the leading topic of my research, the social meaning of time, social understanding and use of time. And memory and forgetting are, of course, related to the way a society or individual understand, um, manage, um, well, project so the relation with, with relationship with time. Then I worked on fashion. But I didn't work on uh, Gucci or uh, Prada and so on. I worked on fashion in the 17th century, where the question that uh, still amazes me after so many years is that how was it possible that in the 17th century we became accustomed to something which is completely familiar to us now, that we refer to reference points precisely because they go by, the tra in time, tra transients, whatever, they, they go by, they change with time. And the idea is that fashion works exactly because we know that what we like as a fashion thing today is something we didn't like last year, and we perfectly know that we'll like next year. But nevertheless, when something's fashion is in, we really like it and follow it. What does it mean for society that our relationship to time changed from so much from stability to, well, transience, so the things that um, change with time? And then if I look at my work on finance, what I've been working is credit in, in, uh, in finance as a present use of, of the future. Because the credit is a mechanism by which you use in the present the wealth that will be produced in the future in the hope that will allow you to produce more wealth to re repay what you have been getting in the present. So also a strange circularity in the use of time that became, well, so extreme that recently with the use of derivative products on financial markets, something related to what uh, Korai was uh, telling us. So again, a question related with time. Um, then uh, probability, of course, is the present estimate of future uncertainty. 
again, social use of time. And now that my project on, about algorithmic prediction, that it has to do with time, I don't have to explain. It's, um, it's kind of, it should be uh, self-explanatory. Um, so what is perseverance coherence in this sense? Uh, when I chose all these topics, I was just fascinated by the topics. I was not following uh, the research topic about time, which is something I had in mind at the beginning. But when I talk in the, uh, years ago with my uh, PhD uh, supervisor in Bielefeld, uh, Niklas Luhmann, I said I would like to work with the, uh, about the social use of time. And of course, he politely and kindly and wisely rejected it. You cannot have a, such a research topic. It's much too broad, much too general. It's, there's no hope that you can start, produce something interesting on such a broad topic. So going to Morris' to, uh, question, how can you research a broad topic over a um, uh, well, um, long um, space of time? And I would think if you have this an ambitious broad topic, you should forget it. You shouldn't think about uh, this broad topic when you choose uh, your research objectives. It, it's rather convenient that you just uh, find, well, from time to time what is interesting for you at the moment, uh, because the coherence, uh, if there's coherence, but perseverance shows up after a while, is not because you were knowing from the beginning what you were doing, but because what keeps your topics together is that you are the researcher. And you have a research perspective that in different topics tends to produce the same kind of approach, the same kind of interest. So uh, in that case, the coherence, what I said before, it's a kind of coherence uh, uh, a posteriori, comes from the perspective of the researcher. In a sense, you don't think about it. Because, well, uh, it can, can sound uh, sort of counterintuitive, but actually, you know the topic only when you worked on the topic. So you think at the beginning, I, sh I choose this topic because I want to, uh, to uh, resolve this question. You will be doomed to have the very general issues about that. But if you choose a topic that will interest you at the moment, then you get into it, and your perspective will lead you to select the uh, aspect of the topic that are actually more coherent with your basic interest. So that's what I mean. I've got, uh, what uh, Moore's question led me to think about a kind of different way as which we can maybe more risky, more serendipity, more chance uh, uh, compatible, but a different way we can understand and practice a kind of well coherence while we are uh, developing a large research projects. Um, and that's I now as a quick example of that, I will refer then quickly to my current research project to show that in that case how it came out, the, how it can be that uh, uh, I have a very broad research topic because my um, project now is about algorithmic prediction and basically the social consequences of algorithmic prediction in our society. So it's a very broad question. And when I wrote the application for the grant, uh, you know, uh, you have to um, mention a breakthrough question, a general question, and I said, which is actually true, that the goal of my project would be to produce a general theory of prediction in digital society, which is actually so uh, scary as a, a broad question. But then if I look, well, then I had to, to prepare the real organization of my research. And uh, I had really to, again, or I choose, to break the issue in very diverse, unrelated questions in the hope that the diversity of the issue will help me uh, deal with the general one. Um, because the general question of my research is um, how, what are the social consequences of algorithmic form of prediction they are in our society, uh, they are very different uh, from the form of prediction we are familiar with. Because in every field of our society, we are refer referring to forms of prediction to management and certain of the future that are basically guided by probability calculus, which is established in several centuries and which has particular way of dealing with uncertainty and with the way of managing in the present to make plans to, uh, to manage it. Uh, and algorithmic prediction is very different from probabilistic form of, of prediction. I mentioned only some topics, we can discuss them uh, more, in, more in the discussion, but while um, probabilistic prediction refers to average values, uh, algorithmic prediction is tendential individual, refers to one particular individual specific moment in time. And uh, while uh, um, probabilistic prediction is general, 
Individuality prediction, I think that refers to what uh, Sabine has been telling to us, refers to a specific database uh, at a specific um, well, um, moment in time also. But also different, the real issue that I'm going to prediction is to generalize this to other topics that are different from the one you are uh, referring to at the moment. And of course, the big problem of algorithmic prediction, we have heard it intense, uh, extensively in the previous panel, is bias. Because for many reasons, because of the data you're using, because of algorithmic bias, well, uh, advanced machine learning, deep learning algorithms are basically, in a sense, un 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 unavoidably biased. So we have to take, to work with that, but, but uh, in transparent algorithm, the problem of uh, uh, controlling bias and this kind of uh, very refined uh, developed tools is a hu huge issue, combined with uh, the even bigger issue that the data we are dealing with are unavoidably biased, especially social data and the data that, uh, well, big data, data this kind of algorithm really require. So how can I deal with uh, these three issues? Uh, individualized prediction, different from the average one we are really referring to. Um, not generalizable results and biased results in a general perspective. So I brought the research in three different fields, uh, hoping, and now it seems to be working in a sense, that the three different fields uh, will produce different views on this general prob um, problem. But I had no idea what the result would be. Uh, and the three fields are insurance, uh, um, pr personalized insurance, uh, precision medicine, and predictive policing. Uh, very, very different fields, uh, and the project requires very different questions, different problems, and very different research methods, because uh, in some cases we have to do ethnographic methods, in some cases we use uh, topic modeling dealing with large database. Uh, in the other case, we have interviews uh, with the firms and with companies working in the field. So the problems are we're different from the beginning, they become more and more different and diverse uh, the more we are developing our research. But actually, I still hope I'm there, the, the, the project is going on, but I keep the idea of the general theory of prediction in mind, and I have the impression that this diverse field, which deal with probability and with prediction in, in a very different way, with different problems, produce something that I think, in that indirect way, can help me develop a, a well, sort of general um, view of the problem, which I know at the beginning, when I wrote the project, I see that I, th I think we need a general theory of prediction, but I wouldn't know how to, to address it uh, if I didn't uh, break it up uh, in very incoherent, uh, diverse, uh, not, uh, not connected research projects. Um, so that's my reflection on perseverance uh, that I hope partly answered to what Morris was asking me. Thank you, Elena, and we go on to Dilip. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here and to present my work over the last 10 years, some degree of perseverance at the University of Witwatersrand. Uh, what I'm going to do is to actually not do a PowerPoint like Elena, because uh, as Lord Acton said, or should have said, power corrupts, but PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So uh, that's a joke I'm going to use tomorrow. Professor Novotny has said it's going to be a different audience tomorrow. So please don't attend the talk tomorrow. So the three themes that I'm going to be talking about, because that's what the Greeks recommended. One is too little, four is too much, so three themes. The first is to, th oh, what does it mean to think beside the sea? And I come from the state of Kerala, which is on the southwestern coast of India, and it was a matter of great astonishment for me once I began doing research that historians of Kerala tended not to think with the sea. They studied largely landed formations, state, temple, land relations, landlords, and so on. The sea was just beside them. It was beside their consciousness. So I thought to myself, why is this so? Why is it that the literary and historical sensibility does not address the sea? And uh, one answer came to me from Borges, where he said there are no camels in the Quran. You know, something that is so obvious you don't need to write about it. But as I began reading more and more, I started working with the work of a literary critic, Kesri Balakrishnapilla, who wrote in the 1930s. 
And uh, he began, he was a polymath, so he translated Ibsen, he translated Prosper Mary May, he introduced Chinese and Japanese literature into my language, Malayalam, as an act of rebellion against British literature. You know, so it's an act of anti-colonialism. I shall no longer read English literature, which was pretty good uh, for him, for those of you who have read the English literature of that time. So Kerala, he, when he wrote his history of Kerala, he began with Rome. And why did he begin with Rome? And he was very conscious of the fact that the southwestern coast of India had been integrated through the oceans with the Roman Empire when Rome and Carthage fought each other and Carthage had to pay tribute in pepper. The pepper came from Kerala. So Pliny, Strabo, Roman historians wrote about Kerala. And this was the great drain of that time that the Roman Empire was sinking money in Kerala in order to get the pepper. And so he posed a question which remains for me a plangent, a resonant question. He said, is Kerala a chapter in the history of Rome or is Rome a chapter in the history of Kerala? Now, this is something that is way before Homi Baba, the Pesh Chakravarti and post-colonial theory. So this division between maritime and terrestrial histories, this dichotomy between land and water was something that puzzled me and started me off on my research. What does it mean to think with the ocean? Many of you are familiar with Fernand Brudel's magnificent work with the long durée on the Mediterranean, uh, the idea of geography, the idea of waters, and so on. But what is very interesting about the title of his book, which a lot of people don't pay attention to, it's the Mediterranean in the age of Philip II. So it's, again, anchored on an individual. And so you have Jacques Rancière's wonderful essay, which is an essay on this book, which is titled The Dead King. So, uh, in many senses, one is drawn back in many ways to terrestrial histories because that is where we see the real action as happening, formation of empires and so on and so forth. So this also led me to the question of time. If we think with terrestrial time, what would it mean then to think with times in the ocean? Are we thinking about vast expanse of time? What is the way of thinking, rethinking time with the ocean? And all of these present fulminations about post-colonial theory seem to me to not address the question. So you have the idea of the post-colonial, which so determinedly hangs on to the hinge of the colonial. So there is that vast space of the pre-colonial, which stretches backward into the dark abysm of time. And then you have the present vexatious post-colonial present. But Neither of these categories can do without the colonial, and the colonial abbreviates our time of history. Right? So I began to think with the, a phrase used by my mentor at Cambridge, Sir Christopher Bailey, who used the idea of the paracolonial, an idea which he did not uh, expatiate. He mentioned in it, it in his work, The Imperial Meridian. And Thinking with the paracolonial as something as time that sits beside the colonial. We have to think with a multiplicity of times and a multiplicity of spaces. So that's the idea, but I'll be speaking about the paracolonial in some detail tomorrow. The second theme came to me from a very political question. What does it mean to think from the global south? What does it mean to think from where you are? To think from Harvard is not the same as thinking from Trivandrum or thinking from Witwaters Rand. We have to think differently. And location matters. So where do we think? And what do we think with? And this question came home to us in 2016 when the universe, students at our post-apartheid university told us that, look, what you're teaching us is useless to us. What you are teaching us belongs to a past which you no longer want to engage with. Why doesn't the university teach us what we want to know? So it upended the process of pedagogy. And this, in some sense, was crucial for the academic enterprise and the knowledge enterprise in South Africa. The idea of decolonizing knowledge, which now has been vitiated through multiple <laughs> right-wing characterizations of it, and it has lost uh, its uh, way in the uh, dead desert of uh, you know, unreason. But when you think about the de decolonizing knowledge, it actually made demands on the university that the university should be to be teaching what people need to know. That this is not a temple where you go to be given something, given a blessing, right? And so very often when you think about the monolingual university in a multilingual landscape, it's this idea of abandoned language, all ye who enter here, 
right? And English, or whatever the language is, becomes the major idea. So I began to think with this idea of amnesia. Right? Colonialism inflicted an amnesia where we began to think with the West. We began to tell our story with histories that came from elsewhere, as Rabindranath Tagore once put it. That it was, to put it simply, Southern fact, Northern theory. And this was the dilemma before us. So it's a volume that I edited, a project that I carried on over four years, working with people across disciplines who worked with 16 languages. And this volume will be out next year. It's called Con Changing Theory, Concepts from the Global South. And the words from Persian, Arabic, Kosa, Zulu, Malayalam, and so on and so forth. And I asked each of them, take a word and think about the conceptual implications of it. Any word, you don't have to locate this word in a tradition. Right? It's not to replace one tradition with another tradition. So it was a literary, philosophical enterprise. And we had uh, 20 words, uh, which actually will, I, I shan't reveal. That's for you to buy and swell my royalties, such as they are. So, But the idea of the concepts in the global south is also uh, the idea that we have to understand that concepts do not have singular provenance. That there is a genealogy and a circulation of ideas across the globe. So what we know now, as Europe is made as much from the Arab inheritance, the carrying over of Arab knowledge. And similarly, when you think about India, China, and so on, so how do we understand genealogy, circularity, and rid ourselves of the anxiety of influence? You know, just to realize that ideas come from everywhere, and how do we actually track them? So from the idea of the global south, you move to the idea of trans-hemispheric conversations, right? So which is the idea that we, and finally, uh, art and the imagination as a third theme. Because just as much as we've tried to think with continuous oceans and continuous spaces, right? That when you think about the ocean, uh, there are these segmented histories of the Atlantic Ocean slavery, Indian Ocean indenture, Pacific Ocean, the Asian uh, American kind of stories, and so on and so forth. But it's all one water. And when the waters rise, we shall be like the animals in Noah's Ark, peering anxiously over the edge. And when we drown, we, we won't be able to identify the Atlantic and the Pacific. Right? So when we think about these continuous oceans and continuous spaces, I started working with the Kochi Biennale, the Art Biennale, which was started in 2012. There are two more things, and I shall end. Uh, so the Kochi Biennale works with the idea of how do we think with the world through the imminence of its disappearance? Because the Kochi is situated by the sea. Very likely, in another 100 years, Kochi and Mumbai will have been swallowed by the waters. I mean, that's a prediction for the present. I hope not. But the Kochi Biennale draws upon an imagination that extends across Southeast Asia, Africa, and so on. It doesn't exist in contention with the Venice Biennale, but it exists in dialogue with the Biennale in Venice, which is very, in many senses, Eurocentric and Orientalist, right? I mean, the, <laughs> the other spaces figure, but they figure in the hierarchy. So finally, I've written about the Kochi Biennale, but finally I'd like to end with a project that was very dear to me, which uh, takes the story of a giraffe, which in 1414 traveled from Malindi in Eastern Africa via Korikod in southwestern India to Bengal, and finally to Emperor Yongle in China. This is a figure that you can find in, uh, on Wikipedia if you look it up. So, Along with a group of people, poets, musicians, and others, I wrote three poems about what it was to be that giraffe. What did the giraffe think on this voyage? Can the subaltern speak, right? So can the giraffe hum? Because giraffes do hum. <laughs> and so we wrote this libretto and opera, which is now up on the YouTube, uh, which you can watch, which is called Giraffe Humming. And it tracks this voyage of a continuous ocean, a continuous space of the traffic in animals and humans and their connection with empires. So we think about a world that is not just us. We move to a world which includes humans, animals, things, all in conversation with each other. And I'll stop here. Thank you.
Thanks, Dilip. And you can stay here, actually. And our two other speakers can come to the front. Um, thank you so much for these wonderful insights into your research. And to add to the giraffe, there is a very interesting parallel to that in um, the Icelandic sagas with a polar bear that travels around and is presented to an emperor. <laughs> so it's very interesting, that too. So I found it very fascinating how your three papers, as different as they may seem at the beginning uh, or at the surface, um, also go together. So Sven has led us into um, the history of capitalism, uh, paying a lot of attention to geographies and how geography shapes uh, our understanding of something very conceptual which can be broken down into chunks of um, understandable, tangible issues. And then you, Elena, brought us to time your personal time, and I'm really grateful for your insights into how do we see ourselves, how do we perceive ourselves as, as researchers. You mentioned bias. I was also thinking of Gadamer's horizons, um, that we're never uh, neutral, um, but also th this, this aspect of, of time in your research, but also time as, as a researcher. And uh, you did a wonderfully combined geography and time to show us that these are two axes um, that, that need to be brought together and if for, the, for the question of what are the histories that we tell ourselves. Ourselves, but also others, right? So this traditional opposition of history and historiography is not an opposition. History is so often influenced by who we are and what, what kind of histories we tell. So I think um, this gives us in very interesting material to, to go on the discussion, which we need to keep short, but I would like to ask the audience for reactions. Um, so this is your moment to, to react with these fascinating speakers, and I would um, urge you not to be too shy. Um, but uh, yeah, as you, as you come up with your questions, we have a couple of minutes. I would again invite our speakers to um, answer to each other's papers in a very brief but concise way, if possible. So maybe we can start with you, Sven, and um, you were the first one to speak, so to, to give your impressions or your answer to the other two. Thank, thank you. I think the papers spoke very directly to one another. Uh, I think the notion of time and changing understandings of time are obviously fundamentally implicated in the history of capitalism, and presumably that concept plays a role in your work as well, though I would be interested actually in knowing if it, if it, if it does. And uh, Dilip, I think, you know, I was thinking about um, the word from, I think you're exactly right that the word looks very different from depending on from what location uh, you're looking at the word. The story that I'm telling has been largely told from a very small subset of places and from a very small subset of the human population. It has uh, told uh, the history of much of the world. Either uh, either has it, it completely ignored it, or it has told it as a story that is just about the victimization of people in uh, in uh, outside the European parts of the world. Uh, or it has told the story as uh, as a word that has not been completely realized yet. It is said uh, that, that, you know, as Marx said, that the future of the world was to be seen by looking at England. Uh, and I think we agree, it sounds to me, that uh, this is not the case. And indeed, if I think about, you know, who influenced me the most in looking at the history of capitalism, it is, it, I found that myself striking when I put together this slide, that it's, it's really people from the global south who for 100 years have said many of the things that I've been saying today and who to me now are perhaps the most insightful and important guides in coming to terms with that history of global capitalism. Dilip, do you want to answer directly to that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I mean, uh, I mean, Swin is being extremely modest here. I first met Swin ten years ago, and his work has been deeply influential in the ways in which I understand capitalism because his work on cotton, right, which again was about multiple geographies. That if you look through a commodity like cotton, you're uh, thinking about filiations, these fine webs of filiations across the globe. 
So when I edited the volume on capitalism last year, which came out from Oxford, I mean, his work certainly played a major role. But one of the questions that we were also asking there is that how do we tell histories of capitalism occurring and not occurring? So we had a chapter on Iran where there was no capitalism. And that helps us answer another kind of question. And there is also this wonderful work when we think it's not just historians from the global south, but when one thinks about the world, that it's interesting to think that it was African consumer demand in the 19th century that drove industrialization in Salem, Massachusetts, and in Bombay, in India. And this is the story that hasn't begun to be told as yet. This is the wonderful work of Jeremy Prestold, who's at University of California. So I think once one starts asking questions which are slightly different, our spaces and times expand in multiple ways. And it's that theme or the object or the person or the ideology that then drives the conception of space. So when Balakrishnabula writes his history of Kerala, he begins with Rome, right? So, yeah. It's also that we are, you know, even though we have been dealing with these issues in right. some ways for 200 years, I think we're only just at the beginning of truly understanding them. Sabina, uh, sorry, Elena. Very short, uh, since we, have, uh, we are running out of time. But uh, um, I think that's what's fascinating me from the very, de the very, very debate and the previous panel as well, relates to your question. You mentioned Gadamer. And uh, I have the impression that we have now, we've seen such diverse research, how we kind of broader sense and maneutical approach uh, is expanding everywhere in so different topics uh, where you are saying that uh, um, space and time are expanding. That's true, but at the same time, they are restrictive because they are, in all our projects, uh, I think an unusual, as uh, somebody gave ago, um, reference uh, to the um, re re relative approach that we have, that uh, the, uh, deep conscious of how space and time are also relative to the perspective of the observer, and all our research in capitalism, in post-colonial studies, in uh, data understanding the work of Sabina, uh, without even referring to the methodological issue, tend to adopt this approach. And that's something that I think is extremely interesting for uh, um, uh, scientific research nowadays, how it's basically we take it for granted uh, without even thinking about it. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes, in, in the third row, please. Uh, thanks for your talk. Oh, can I take it off? Yeah. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm Silvio Zuko. I'm a PhD candidate at the WCP and Humboldt University. And uh, I just wonder when I look from, from, from above uh, to your three talks, um, what is, how, how can we understand this spectrum between imagining things and knowing things. So, so what I take from your three talks is we now really take into account our ability to imagine different times, different places, to imagine the point of views from things and from animals and so on. And how does it enhance our ability to know? And how can we, in, in, in a last step maybe, take this to change things and impact the world? Because obviously we are now talking here in a very little exclusive panel, but how can we, you know, take this view, this imaginative capability, I would call it, and spread it through our societies, so to say? May I? Yeah, actually, this is an important question. I mean, I personally don't have much uh, uh, of... Uh, how should I put it? I don't much agree with this distinction that you make between imagination and knowing. I think this imagination that we are making of larger worlds, larger times, the intersection of histories, the intersection of peoples, also draws us to the current dilemma that we are facing right now. Right When we continue to have a very old-fashioned political theory that makes us think with nation states, citizens, and borders, we tend to think with the idea of the citizen and the stranger. What would it mean, and this is the crisis that Europe is facing, which I hope that people from the global south can help you to address. Right? We live with diversity, we live with movement, we live with the fact that most of the people in places like South Africa come from elsewhere, and we hand manage that, and we live. South Africa belongs to everyone who lives in it. So we need a European political theory that is premised not on the citizen, but on the refugee and the migrant, because that 
is the condition of the world. So I think that that is where the connection between imagination and use or imagination and knowledge comes in that if Europe is to renew itself, to imagine itself afresh, it has to think about these multiple connections and to think the world through movement rather than through stability. Thank you. I'm sure there are so many more things to say about this. Um, keep them for the so-called fishbowl, which we'll have um, at noon, um, which will give all of us, um, all of you, the opportunity to chime in uh, on various questions. But for now, thank you again to our speakers, and we'll meet again in five minutes for the third panel. Hallo nochmal, es ist ähm, wieder soweit für das dritte Panel mit dem Thema Networking and Communication und um, I'm, I've just noticed I'm speaking German. Um, I, I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> well, um, luckily no one of you cared, so everyone, so that's great. Well, um, welcome to the third panel with our speakers Michelle Lamont and Dara Kitsenko, and we'll do it the same way. We first have the two statements, we have some more time now, and um, afterwards we'll have a discussion. So, Michelle, I pass on the word to you. I was just checking to see if everyone is awake and ready for uh, another session. So uh, I took our assignment very seriously. I'm a good girl. I do what I'm told. So my, the question that was given to me is um, in the current zeitgeist, so this is very broad, how do we interpret the current zeitgeist? How do we go about uh, networking and also communicating our work? Tomorrow I'm giving another presentation where I'll talk about my research. So today some of what I'm going to talk about is tied to my research, but it's really not about my research agenda. Although the question that was asked to me, I'm very much asking it through the prism of a sociologist of knowledge who is concerned with the production, diffusion, and legitimation of knowledge. So the questions I'm asking are very much about how in the current moment, with three different challenges that we're encountering, how do we as social scientists think about uh, the importance of producing knowledge that has more impact, and what are the uh, uh, you know, problems that we need to overcome? So, um, of course, what we need to think about is uh, the new public sphere. You know, we all, many of us, I think, were first uh, socialized in an uh, understanding of, uh, uh, you know, the social sciences as functioning in a public sphere as defined by Habermas uh, before the social media and also before what has been now called a, a new media ecosystem, uh, a professionalized public sphere where you have a number of NGOs that are specializing in scaling up messages, but also in tweaking messages in such a way that they are far more, uh, far more performative. Uh, there's a number of uh, uh, high-tech organizations that are collaborating very closely with social movements, for instance, to figure out uh, if you're going to promote uh, you know, climate change in Poland, uh, how do you do it as compared to the US? So the whole industry of narrative formation is, has become very big business. And many of them are working very closely with, uh, with social movements. So we need to think about us as cultural creators, creators of common sense that are doing research that is empirically based. But uh, with the, uh, the Trump election uh, in the American context, certainly, a great many social scientists became extremely uh, attuned and alarmed by what uh, the development around us. So we decided, many of us, decided to try to produce knowledge that would have more of a direct impact. Even before Trump's election, in American sociology, uh, Michael Borovoy, when he was president of the ASA, the American Sociological Association, and then of the International Sociological Association, gave a huge push for us to produce knowledge that was uh, more socially uh, engaged with the problems of the day. It led to a big polarization within the discipline between the politicos and the, the professionals. But then with time, this polarization became far less salient, and many of the younger sociologists became really literally obsessed 
with uh, writing blogs and you know really scaling up the impact of their research. So this is the context that we are uh, living in today as a, a social scientist, I would say, not only in sociology, but in political science as well. You've had books such as uh, Steve Levitsky and Dan Ziblatt, How Democracy Dies, which had huge impact uh, on the conversation, which was read by you know uh, many political leaders. So it's a, it's a context where we can see that the demand for social science knowledge has become even more pressing. Uh, with the crisis of uh, expertise, many people have wanted to hear uh, that all the uh, the challenges with the, the pandemic, the refusal to wear masks. I think uh, in the public sphere, many politicians have also become far more attuned to how social science knowledge is crucial to addressing the, the current crisis. It's not only a medical problem that we're encountering, it's also very much problems tied to how people are receiving expertise. So that's the context in which we're intervening as meaning makers. And it's also a context in which um, my colleagues, some sociologists, have now been able to document in a much more fine-grained way the way in which knowledge diffuse. So one paper in particular that I want to mention to you that has been extremely well received by Tim Hallett et al. in American Sociological Review, which pointed to how uh, uh, sensitizing uh, conceptual devices such as bowling alone, associated with Robert Mutton's book, or the concept of the clash of uh, civilization, of Huntington, second shift, of Arlie Hochschild, this paper uh, documents very precisely how those themes uh, diffused as points of reference in the major newspapers, but also much more broadly. So we understand the ways in which we can contribute directly in uh, social, as social scientists, but also how we compete with other sources of uh, uh, cultural diffusion in influencing how people come to think about the world. So at the same time as the young generations became uh, very obsessed with uh, producing knowledge that would have more impact, we've also seen a transformation of gatekeeping. People of my generation, we would write books and you know, really impatiently wait for the first reviews to come out in specialized journals, such as, in my field, contemporary sociology or American Jewish sociology. And this is what would determine whether or not you were going to get tenure. For the young generations, uh, reputations can be built independently on Twitter, which means that they have experienced, or many of you in the room have experienced a revolution in how gatekeeping is being produced in the discipline, the mechanisms of uh, control and uh, uh, consecration, to use a Bolsonian term, have really been transformed in very deep ways, but no one really talks about this, I think, very publicly, in part because there's a little bit of a generational clash between the millennials and the boomers, with the boomers thinking, who are these young people? They're just produced knowledge that is not being you know, properly reviewed, and, pro and then they're a little bit usurping by you know, going around the path of legitimation of knowledge that we've experienced, which many people think are the legitimate path. And all this, at least in the American context, is occurring in the context of also a cancel culture in academia that people are not really talking about. But there's a lot of canceling that's happening on uh, Facebook. And the question of who is, side, who is siding with, with diversity or against diversity in the discipline ends up really being a very important mechanism for sorting through which some people just become totally, you know, uh, disappear. So this is really important, I think, that we converse about this, because it has to do with what kind of knowledge are we going to, you know, produce for the future, and what are the new mechanisms that we're going to put in place to control the quality of knowledge. So I invite you to think about this, and this is partly what my uh, little uh, uh, conversation with you here is about. So the change is not only, if you think about streaming, if you think about Netflix, it has opened a huge new world of diffusion, which is far more diverse. Uh, in music, for instance, you have Patreon, where it's possible to support artists directly. So it's not anymore a context that we had previously with Hollywood or the major record label really controlling at the entry point who could diffuse or not. The 
same thing has happened in academia in that the market is way more open than it was previously. But um, at the same time, many people, and we've seen this huge increase in the number of social scientists who are producing, publishing, and PNAS, the proceeding of the National Academy of Science, nature, science, though sociology was largely totally excluded from these uh, publications until very recently. So it's really exciting to see that the scientific community as a whole is becoming more uh, open to the social sciences. Um, but we have not done much work yet. I know as I prepared these uh, comments, I was very, I was told this is a gathering of people who um, are involved in the, the knowledge production industry in, uh, in Germany, uh, people who think about science policy. I've, I've written a book on peer review, how professors think. Against that background, I thought, well, most of people in Europe who are thinking about changing conditions of knowledge production are thinking about cha changing conditions of peer review. That's important, but I think far more important is to do a kind of broader sociology of knowledge of the where, where is the knowledge produced and what are the mechanisms of diffusion and control and how they are escaping the control of older generation in a context of acute internationalization. And this older generation has experienced conditions of production of knowledge that are drastically different from those experienced from the, the younger generation. So I think we need to think about these uh, questions very seriously. So the first challenge, I mentioned three challenges that we're now encountering. What is the current zeitgeist that I've been asked to discuss? One of them is political polarization. Um, Chris Bale has already discussed, uh, briefly alluded to the work of uh, uh, Pariser on the echo chambers and the filter bubbles. In the literature in political psychology, a field that is now exploding, shows that uh, people's affiliation, political affiliation, are much more guided by identification and emotion than it is by formal uh, policies or policy differences between countries. This is a cottage industry now. Many people could think that uh, this uh, polarization, effective polarization in politics, is more salient in the US. But in fact, a recent study by Noam Gidron shows that uh, the countries where it's most polarized counterintuitively is uh, Switzerland, Ireland, and Spain. The US is totally in the middle when you compare to uh, uh, 20 uh, advanced industrial societies. But you know, nevertheless, um, with the focus on polarization, we forget, it's easy to forget that in the American context, more than 50% of the population are not voting. So we have the famous uh, uh, incel, so those are the, the patriots, uh, involuntary uh, celibate, very important point of reference in the media, who are simply uh, apolitical and are trying to lead their lives below the radar, but they also ag uh, engage in a lot of aggression on the social media. But there's a whole network of anti-statist uh, people who just reject their involvement in politics. So this is uh, the context in which we're working as social scientists, and who's able to influence this more than 50% of the population that is not voting is absolutely, absolutely crucial. And the polarization is not necessarily coming from where we think, because uh, one of my colleague at Brown Caleb Scoville has shown that, for instance, the politicization of the, the mask it doesn't come from the conservative, it comes from the progressive. If you, they did the big study of tweets on the topic, and they found that the vast majority of tweets came from progressive and liberals who are denouncing the conservative for Publici uh, politicizing the mask. In fact, it's us who are politicizing the mask. The conservative and the Republicans don't talk about not wearing the mask as a political issue that much. So I could go on uh, about the other challenges very briefly. Uh, Elena's talk was very much about uncertainty, the prediction, uh, the difficulty with uh, anticipating the future. Well, of course, the pandemic has been the uber context of this with many young generations. I'm sure those of 
us in the room who have uh, uh, Gen Zs in our family have seen how, and you know, graduate students, we all deal with graduate students, how painful the last two years have been for them with the utter impossibility of knowing what is ahead. And even for all of us, you know, I'm sure many of us here, it's our first trip since the, the start of the pandemic, like just the idea that you would take the, fly somewhere is suddenly a novel experience, right? So, um, you know, the context of the pandemic uncertainty has made the demand for knowledge even more crucial. Who has the tools for how to help people project themselves into the future in a context of great uncertainty? Well, we are there. We are the people who, who, have speci who are specializing in, you know, looking at data and projecting into the future. We can do it not very well, but we're somewhat uh, equipped to do it. The third big crisis is, of course, the rejection of expertise. Uh, I was surprised by uh, Sabina's uh, conclusion that, in fact, uh, we're moving to toward a future where contextual knowledge will be even more needed because I have graduate students, one in particular who did her dissertation on comparing political consulting as a field in France and the US with a lot of in-depth interviews. And these are fields that have been revolutionized by AI. Uh, the young people who have control of the technical tool to do big data are totally, you know, declaring obsolete anyone who has contextual knowledge because that knowledge is viewed as anecdotal. I have a friend who's a stockbroker whose job it is to supervise a bunch of young people who have zero knowledge about stockbroker, uh, the stock market, but because they have the technical knowledge, they're totally you know, disqualifying uh, his generation. And this is happening, you know, in many other fields. So uh, the fate in AI, even if, you know, Elga Novotny has a new book on this, is really, I think, transforming how we understand the place of expertise in daily life. And it is, of course, you know, this adding to um, the, um, the anti-intellectualism and the skepticism towards science that uh, many of the non-college educated are expressing, I think we, we are facing a, a very complex situation. So this is the very difficult background uh, against which uh, we need to think about how to move forward, how to think about our capacity to network and to project our knowledge uh, more broadly and with, with more impact. So um, there's a book I read that I found extremely informative. It's uh, titled Fox Populism, and it's on Fox News. It's written by an expert in uh, communication studies, Respect. We spent a lot of time looking very, very closely at how do you explain the success of this uh, pseudo you know, news channel. And what he finds is that uh, they engage in infotainment. It's not information, it's entertainment. And his argument is very Bozioian. He says what this uh, you know, television uh, channel has been able to do is to offer the working class, which is anti-intellectual, exactly what they want. It's about emotion and the kind of uh, eth uh, habitus that is projected is all about you know, emotions. So when Trump talks about grabbing the pussy, it's perfect because it resonates with the conception of gender relationship that the average uh, viewer embraces. So it's the most convincing explanation that I've seen of uh, the enormous success of, uh, you know, not comparable, way bigger than any other uh, uh, news. So the takeaway is the importance of emotional resonance, which most of us as academic, as we are studying patterns in our data, we are totally uh, negating, you know, we're totally engaged in a cognitive uh, exercise, which is about, you know, ident identifying patterns. And um, I totally share the opinion that, you know, to do good research, that's what you need to do. But when it comes to communicating our research, we're kind of a bunch of autistic people, you know. We don't realize that we need to actually create resonance with our audience. And the vast majority of the population thinks of us as elitist, self-serving idiots, you know, and the rejection of uh, elitism is palpable, I think, through, you know, whether we look at uh, uh, surveys in the United States and elsewhere, and that's something that many academics have been refusing to see. When we look at the huge movement of recognition claims uh, across the 
you know, the, the parts that I know, Europe and, Europe and the US, were very attuned to all the, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, we can read all the groups that are rising um, and uh, claiming their place under the sun and wanting to be seen, huge recognition movements that I'm gonna talk about tomorrow. But we can also think of uh, Make America Great Again, MAGA, as a recognition clave movement. Uh, all the working class people who feel that they're losers at the same time as the society has been restructured around a technocratic, meritocratic uh, society where people like us who have a lot of degrees in cultural capital are uh, declaring everybody else a loser. So I think that in this context, it's very important that we examine much more closely and ask ourselves question about the kind of class ethnocentrism that we engage in uh, on a daily basis as the people who have knowledge and the legitimacy and all the advantages that comes with this. Um, so that's the first point in terms of fine tuning our uh, communication skills, uh, develop our emotional intelligence. The other one would be to really think more systematically about uh, how to make our knowledge more uh, resonant. Here we have something to learn from AI in terms of not only how we can scale up our knowledge, many people are joining forces with uh, you know, other uh, tools of cultural diffusion um, and also trying to tweak their message so that it is more resonant with the public. In my own case, I've spent my life writing books for my peers, but uh, after Trump, I decided to get an agent and get the book contract with Simon and & Schuster, and yes, I'm gonna do very soon a TED Talks, things that I would never have done otherwise. But then when you realize in the American context, the enormous impact of the absence in the public sphere of people like me, and I think I really understand a lot of things that could make a difference. So I want to be able to learn to write them in a way that you might think what I'm doing is simplistic, but I don't need to convince people like you. I think the ideas I have, a lot of other people have, and I really need to talk to find ways to talk to people who are not typically reached by the social sciences. And it's been very difficult to learn how to do this, but I think it's worth it, you know, to the extent that creating the social change is, I think, at least what motivates me as a, as a social scientist. So the, my, these comments are really an invitation to all of us to try to think uh, much more broadly about the challenges that we're facing now as academics that as we're thinking about the current moment, we should think not only about changing or making the culture of peer review less corrupt or more, you know, uh, less bias in favor of certain research uh, instead of others, but really thinking much more about the, uh, the kind of public sphere that we're operating in, in a context also where I think it's increasingly a, a winner-take-all uh, intellectual market. And uh, we need to engage in uh, difficult conversations, for instance, about what can be, what is uh, disable in France, what can be said what kind of conversation can we have as an academic community about what can be said and what cannot be said? I will just conclude by saying that in my world, a lot of what is put on Twitter, which uh, counts as knowledge, is in fact moral boundaries. People taking positions and saying, now it's good to say X, and if you say Y, you're morally bankrupt. But most of these declarations don't have to do with knowledge. They are political position making, which is totally fine. People can take them, but at the same time, you want to be clear about what's political and what's moral, and be very explicit and articulate around these things. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I think we go on with Daria straight away. Hello everyone, good afternoon. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here. Just what Michel just said, this is the first work trip for me in the last two years, and it feels absolutely fantastic to get started into the new normal exactly here 
and with this really respectable audience. My name is Daria Grizenko. I'm an assistant professor in area studies and digital humanities at the University of Helsinki. And today I'm going to share with you some ideas about my most recent, absolutely unfinished, and I think absolutely exciting research project that is called Sustainable Infosphere. I also took my uh, homework seriously, and it has been also uh, fantastic to see what uh, is the span and breadth of questions that the organizers have uh, asked us to, to contemplate on. So the question I got in this lottery uh, was how can we build productive interconnections between fields of knowledge that are vastly considered to be separate, such as digital data and uh, environmental sustainability. And this is where I'm going to share with you a few ideas about digitalization and sustainability. In fact, the topic of the so-called twin transitions uh, does seem to be in the air, and it's one of the mantras of the current EU Commission. But there are, academically speaking, no real conceptual tools well developed to link the two. And this is exactly what I see as my task at the moment. Um, I use infosphere as a bridging concept to link the fields of digitalization and sustainability, to open up scholarly dialogue, and hopefully get to the transdisciplinary direction so that we can eventually also bridge science and policy. Today, I'm going to proceed in three steps. Firstly, I will show how productive analogy can be drawn between biosphere and infosphere. Second, I will talk about the, what I call a problem of virtuality that makes our thinking about the infosphere flawed. And then I will make a few suggestions on how to correct it and how can we advance sustainable infosphere. Thank you. Uh, infosphere can be defined as a realm of information, data, knowledge, and communication. This is the definition that has been given by an uh, uh, Oxford-based philosopher, Luciana Floridi. But I think that not many of you have heard the term infosphere before. And yet, at the same time, uh, it's, it, th this term lends itself to interpretation without much background needed, because it builds upon an analogy. And analogies are very powerful in, in science and science communication, right? So it b builds upon biosphere, a, a well-known concept. It describes the living environment of our planet that contains all forms of life. Now, usually, if you look into scholarly work that uses the term infosphere, it says something like, well, infosphere is like biosphere. And then it continues from there. And this is what somehow got me very unsettled. I really wanted to know, so if you say this, what do you actually imply? So in which sense is infosphere something like biosphere? How far can we go here? And where are the boundaries? So I think that there are a few properties that if we think them carefully through, yes, th there is some resemblance, and it is a productive resemblance. It is a resemblance that can help us make some progress in thinking about this information environment that we are immersed in. So first, Infosphere, what it does, it claims the importance of information and communication in human societies. It is the lifeblood of society. Just like biosphere claims the importance of biological life, it claims the importance of um, photosynthesis and some basic properties that, in, that make life happen. Uh, infosphere is there just to tell us information enables social life. Dot. So the second thing what infosphere as a concept does is that biosphere comprises of, as we all know, various forms of life. And infosphere also contains a variety of information organisms, or so inforks, as it's being called uh, in Floridi's work, 
Yet among all infoRx, humans have the largest influence on the development of the infosphere, and in particular, we took a real uh, way forward in, in, in shaping the infosphere through the technological development and the new ICTs. So the point here is that infosphere has been there forever, just as long as humans have been there. But in the last mm, a bit less than 100 years, really something happened to the infosphere. And what, this is what we can compare to anthropogenic pressure in the biosphere. So we can think of ourselves as this shaping force also in the, in the infosphere. And finally, this analogy also hints at some kind of a cyclical process in the infosphere. We generate information out of data, we consume information, and upon this consumption, we dissipate it to data again. And this is like a biogeochemical cycle with auto and heterotrophs in the biosphere. So these are the three very productive analogies. And this is where we say, well, and that is why infosphere is like biosphere, we can treat them in a similar manner, and this is also important when it comes to policy and governance. But this is actually, when, when we go that far, then many would disagree and say, no, wait, there are at least two problems here. And one problem is that uh, biosphere is, is natural, and infosphere is man-made. It's uh, inherent to, to human societies. And uh, this is a criticism that can be responded to in two ways. So either you say, well, infosphere is actually much broader, and it, there's not only humans who communicate, right? Communication happens at different levels and scales, so infosphere is much broader, and human communication is just a part of it. Or the second and more anthropocentric perspective on this would be to say, well, of course there are differences, but yet, mm, from a human perspective, these are immensely complex systems that impact our well-being, that impact the way how life unfolds, how societies shape and form, and hence uh, there, are, there is enough similarity to say that uh, we can uh, re regard them as complex systems to be, to be dealt with. Uh, and, and then there is a second, the second problem, the second objection. And uh, I was very happy that this, uh, this is a topic that has been already talked about today. And this is what I call uh, the problem of virtuality. Uh, infosphere is usually described as the realm of intangible and immaterial. We already heard these two words today. Uh, thinking of digital, we always brought to think about virtual and online and cloud and something there in opposition to here of the biosphere, which is thought of as material, immediate, and very important here, natural, as opposite to virtual. Uh, but I think it's not such an inconsistency. It's more that we are misled by our language and our imaginaries of the infosphere. Because if we pause just for a second, we immediately recognize that the idea of the infosphere, something intangible and immaterial, is flawed. And yet we are so commonly uh, misled by this idea that we say, well, you know, it's virtual, so how can you govern it? How can you govern something that is not real, that is abstract, that is virtual? There is no way we can do anything about it. And in the past, especially 20 years, we have been seeing how we will be shying away from governance and regulation in this sphere for different purposes, and I think that the way how global capitalism functions has a lot to do with this. But at the stage of the arguments, it has very often been relating to this is just not possible. Um, but yet, it is very possible. And it's possible because the infosphere is material, and it's material in at least two distinct ways, or maybe even three. So first, um, all we know that the digital runs on material devices, they require plastic, they require metals, they require energy, and this is the very simple infrastructural materiality that is known to all of us, but at the same time escapes our minds immediately when we think about virtual. Second, we also recognize that experiences that we make online feel just as real to us 
as any experience is offline. And this is what I now provisionally term phenomenological materiality. I need to revise my terms at some point later in this project. Uh, so let's start with the infrastructure. Digitalization has an unprecedented impact on the infosphere. It allows us to generate, process, and store information using binary code, thereby the divides between devices, formats, and places become negligible. Connecting the world's digital information requires large material infrastructure. Uh, conservative forecasts estimate that by 2030, 20% of electricity used globally will be attributable to ICTs, which already now has fueled the debate whether digitalization is part of a problem or part of a solution when it comes to the global climate crisis. German-American physicist Rolf Landauer famously argued that information is physical. Information is always tied to physical representation, be it a signal in our brain, a mark on a paper, or binary code. And exactly these physical representations makes information leave material marks on our planet. Moreover, we know from science and technology studies that infrastructure can be also thought of as having material agency. And this is not to be anthropomorphic in this sense, but rather to say that it has an impact upon social ordering. Now, if we turn to the second facet, to infosphere's materi materiality, uh, as a, as a phenomenological one. Information is a value add, right? It reduces uncertainty, as theories of human action indicate, and it has something to do with human decision making. So in this way, information is performative, and this is what we've heard today again. It shapes us, our perceptions, our ideas, our actions. So all our information practices are thereby directly linked to the material reality in which we are acting. Materiality of the infosphere, to me, gives the conceptual basis for thinking about sustainability of the infosphere. So what kind of sustainable infosphere could there be and what would it even mean to think about a sustainable infosphere? And I would suggest that if, if, if we take just very um, basic definition of sustainability, it would be very much the same. It would be an infosphere that uh, allows current generation to thrive and also gives this opportunity to the future generations. So it would mean for me to refocus our attention from governance of technology to governance of the information environment. And I think this is an important shift that we would need to, hap would need to make happen in order to, be, uh, to get to the really core of the problem. Because we have been seeing in, in the realm of natural environment this high modernist idea of governing nature failing dramatically. And in the past 30 years, we've, built, we've been building up knowledge and models of how to govern the environment, which is not governance of nature or natural resources specifically, but it's actually everything is about us. It's about how to govern uh, human beings in relation to the environment. So this is where I think what we could think about is how to create responsible Inforex who produce and consume information responsibly in many different ways. And uh, what I'm now working with is the extension of environmental governance principles to the digital environment. And how could that help us to make the infosphere more sustainable? Today I'm going to just give you a little teaser about three classical principles of environmental governance that I see ex extendable, but at the same time not without certain problems and controversies that we would need to address. So a very well-known principle, polluter pays. The person who causes pollution should bear the cost of the damage caused and any remedy required. So now imagine you are walking in the forest and you see somebody 
dumping a bag of trash in the forest, you already know immediately, oh, no, you can't do this, right? It just feels wrong. This is a wrongdoing. Moreover, in many countries, it's a criminal offense. Now you see somebody dumping some polluting information, some fake news in the infosphere. How do you feel about that? Do, do you kind of get the same emotion from that or not, right? And do you feel like this should be a reason for criminal offense? Okay, now we are intersecting with so many difficult issues here if we make this statement go so far. But how important is that to think about? Precautionary. There are, if there are uncertainties about the risks, protective measures should be taken without having to wait until the harm materializes. Also the principle known as better safe than sorry. In the field of biosphere protection, we long understood that not every technology and not any innovation is just good per se. We need to change our mindset in relation to the infosphere where we still think that whatever innovation should be welcomed and we just cannot stall innovation. We should first try it out. No, maybe precautionary is just a better principle, better approach. At least our dealing with the natural environment shows that it is. And finally, I really like the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, which tells us that individuals and organizations all bear responsibility. But due to their varying capabilities, we cannot expect each contribution to be same or equal, but yet nobody can be exempted from contributing. What would it actually mean? Because right now, again, individuals, organizations, nations, we do not have a clear picture of who is contributing what, to which extent. So when you see now people driving around in their cars for leisure, you think, well, this is not a good practice. This is not good for climate. But you probably have heard recently has been a lot in the news that video streaming services account to, by some estimates, up to three quarter of internet related energy use. So we of course need more sustainable data centers, but we may also need to review our individual information practices. So if putting it very far, I would say if you're not eating meat for climate reasons, you probably should cancel your Netflix subscription right now. That's just the reality of it. So to conclude, what I wanted to do today in response to the task that has been posed to me by the organizers is to show how a concept such as infosphere, a bridging concept, lends itself to link two topics that often uh, go unnoticed and not related, digitalization and sustainability how thinking about materiality of the infosphere allows us to develop policy relevance and to address the most urgent societal concerns of our times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daria. Yes, you can stay. Maybe you can go there. Michelle can come and join us here. So, yeah, why not this way? Um, thank you both for um, these insightful, refreshing um, opinions and views into your research and your research environment, really. Um, what we have seen in both your statements is that we need a communication between the old and the new, to pose it as that bluntly. Um, uh, Michelle, you have you've highlighted the generational boundaries or the shifts that um, happen, but but then there there is this backlog of of um, of, of coping with it or processing it, and then also um, what I would like to underline in this way in this in this sense is also the communication between different academic cultures and the public. Um, which in both your um, papers or statements has become obvious, but also the um, communication within academia itself that is um, among different disciplines. And um, here's where I would like to just mention how important our symposium is today, how important this format is, and how important it is that the social science and the humanities are here at the Science Summit. 
um, we we take it as self-granted, but um, it is not. Um, it, quite often, the humanities and social science, um, but the humanities even more so, do do not count as science. Quite often, you have this the phrase the science and the humanities, and um, I think we we should reflect on that and and also um, acknowledge that this kind of format that we're having today actually leads to bridging these gaps. And, and leads to also um, making sure that the social science and the humanities are visible. So visibility is also something that both of you have talked about, especially you, Michelle, and how important it is. And um, therefore, I would like to just um, bring back into your minds and raise the attention that um, there is an application for the Social Science Summit, um, a yearly annual application, and please consider it and share it and keep that in mind um, in order to increase our visibility. And after this small talk itself, I would like to give our speakers the opportunity to answer to each other's statements. Yes, uh, I, f I mean, what you're studying is not something that I know very well, but it seems to me that you're really working at the frontier of knowledge, but even the concept uh, of infosphere I was not familiar with. Um, so a few things come to my mind. I have, I've actually have three points. One is um, the appeal to governance uh, principles. And a little bit from a critical stance, you know, this is uh, uh, true of, I think, any efforts to establish governance mechanism or institutions of principle. There's always a kind of idealist aspect to it that never, the tire seems to never hit the, the, the ground, so uh, it remains often at the level of uh, wishful thinking. And yet the problems that you're concerned with are so crucial that it seems to me there's a real uh, urgency to this. So take example, the parallel you did between people dumping you know, pollution in the forest versus people dumping false information, which is something we experience all the time. And yet the mechanisms for uh, controlling Trump or you know whatever uh, sources of uh, falsehood are basically non-existent, um, and I think to understand maybe how to um, do this at the ground level, it really requires to draw. I'm, I came to mind the literature on varieties of capitalism, which is all about you know how the state in various countries is dealing with oligopolies and control of competition. So of course in Europe you are so much ahead of the game when it comes to controlling Facebook, you know. In the US uh, there was just very recently, well three days ago, mechanisms of to limit facial recognition. But I was just, uh, Chris uh, Bale happens to do a lot with Facebook. He knows what's happening there at the ground level. So I asked him about it. He said it's not a problem for them because they already have all the data. <laughs> And there's already other organizations that have been punished similarly with, with fines. So they had absolutely no choice about it. And they're all selling uh, several of, you know, Amazon, they're all selling to each other the same information. So basically, it's over already. And they say yes after there's no more economic stakes there. So, and to me, this seems to be a case of where the citizens are so, me including, probably most people in this room, we have no idea how this works. And there's no international bodies uh, where the information is being. So to stop with my long diatribe here, concretely, what can be done beyond you know, the general principles of uh, you know, governance uh, agreements, which have generally proven to be toothless? Yeah, these are great points. Thank you so much for reflecting on this. Out of desperation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And at the same time, reflecting upon what you have been talking about, you raised many important topics, but I guess this last point that you raised, and very much also in connection to the, yeah. this criticism that you posed now to, to this research that I'm doing, it's just you, you showed it brilliantly how difficult it is to actually uh, be really relevant and not only from the point of view of uh, the ivory tower. So the, the, this impact statement that you write in your grant application and the real uh, work that needs to happen to have impact mm -hmm. are just so far away from each other. 
and I don't know what exactly needs to happen, mm -hmm. yeah. but I, I think this is just you're so much to the point mm -hmm. saying yeah. saying that. Yeah, so the, the next question would be, how do you create the institutions you need for this to work? So the EU seems to have been so much more efficient, but what happens in the context where we don't have that, right? One small answer to what needs to be happening. I think what we have today is, is a step towards that, this kind of exchange that yeah. we're having today. I have two questions, um, three actually. Could you imagine, some of you, I have one from David Stark, who's been waiting for a while. Could you imagine to keep your statements for the fishbowl, which would be great, because that's a format where you can come to the front and, um, and make that statement then. Yeah, that's great. Then David, I would, you, would you like to keep that too for the fishbowl? Yeah. You can? That's great because then we all have 10 minutes, a 10 minute break to have coffee and wash our hands and meet again. Yeah, so hello again for this very interesting and new format that we're trying out, a so-called fishbowl. The idea being that we have four, at the moment, four people um, at the front who will just give their impulse, their question, their opinion, their ideas, and um, the, the leading question, new, perspe new perspectives, but also perhaps just responding to the panel that, they, that we've just heard, or to um, the inspiration that they had um, in, in the uh, previous panels. And then the idea is that if one of you would like to add something or... Uh, respond to something that has been said, you can just stand up and come to the front. So there is always a floating fifth place, meaning that as soon as you come to the front, one of these people um, will sit down, and, um, but you don't have to sit down immediately. So if you think you have something else to say, and especially don't leave me alone in the front. So I don't want everyone to feel like they can sit down. But this is a, just a way to... Um, interact with, with the group and, and to make sure that different views um, are heard. Right, I think we'll, we'll, we'll just start with the three um, people who, who, had, um, who re had raised their arms. So David, if you don't mind, just... Um, this is on? Yeah. Okay, I'm David Stark from Columbia University. And uh, I don't have a question, but it's a comment. And it in some ways links Sabina and Michelle. Uh, so, Michelle, you talked about what are the challenges of being a social scientist and a public intellectual in the 21st century? Um, and one of the things you mentioned was that you thought, now, the new public intellectual gives TED Talks. That's, that's interesting for me. Okay. But that's not, that's not what I want to talk about. I want to put your remarks in a historical context. So, I think we're living in a period of acute class struggle. You don't have to be a Marxist to look at class. and Marxism is not the only way to look at class. But if we think about what happened at the turn of the 20th century, there was a, an emerging new knowledge class. Um, and when we, it, it said, you know, we have our, we legitimate our income are part of the social surplus because we have a specialized knowledge. It was led by an engineer, Frederick Winslow Taylor. It took different directions in the Soviet Union and in our societies it, it took another one. And now we have the new engineers, the software engineers, and they're challenging the specialized knowledge of the scientific community the professions broadly, managerial professional class. And I think we have a class struggle that's going on. Um, and it's an interesting one. We're part of it and we also have to be analyzing it. And I'm not saying that, you know, everybody in AI is a villain. I'm not at all. That's an interesting thing. And my remarks have to be necessarily kind of symbolically violent and simplistic. But what I see as our challenge is if we are social scientists, which means that we are engaged in a specialized knowledge. What does that mean in the situation which, as Michelle, and your comments really made me start to think about this, where our specialized knowledge is seen as part of the elite and 
not legitimated for this very reason in a situation in which there is a real possibility in which the machine learning specialist of a particular, it's a very particular kind of specialized knowledge because as Sabine is saying, it's a specialized knowledge that is acontextualized. It's, it says we don't have to be contextualized. We have a specialized knowledge of how to, how to program, how to, how to code, how to do these kinds of things. Uh, but there is a danger in our moment that we're living in right now where AI and populism go together. The challenge for us, I think, you see why this is not a question. This is a comment. And now I want to I hear what different people think is the answer. Like, what do we do? We ally with the AI people? We ally with the populace? Or how can we be specialized social scientists who promote democratization? That's our challenge. Not to be elitist, but not to give up on our specialized knowledge and somehow do that promoting democracy. Great. I, I feel like people want to clap to that. Um, <laughs> but uh, we'll go on. Um, thank you for, for this input. And maybe you can say your name before. Yeah. Thank you. Well, my name is Alma. Uh, I'm from Mexico. Uh, I work at a research center, a center for uh, research and advanced studies in, in, in Mexico City, uh, in fact. And I want to ask you about, uh, well, first of all, let me talk about a little about my story uh, and, and my concerns and, and, and the, the reason of my concerns. Um, I was trained as a biological scientist, uh, and every day I heard the complaints of my professors about the science policy, uh, you know, the, the budget and so on. And when I asked them, okay, you have completely, uh, you, you have the, all the right, but what, as scientists, what can we do for improve our conditions, or laboral conditions even, or budget for science and so on? And they told me, oh, no, 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 no. I, I have a lot of work uh, in my lab, and I don't have time to waste on that, those things, right? So in my mind, it was like, come on, but if you think that this is a waste of time, and on the other hand, this is a, a very, very limited status for, for us, uh, we are in a vicious cycle, you know? Uh, and so I decided to change my career. Uh, and go for for a study uh, the, the policy making processes and and so on. Um, I work in in the Congress in my country. Uh, we were able to change some laws for uh, for for our conditions as scientists. But uh, even with that uh, things, uh, my colleagues things that you are not more a scientist if you, if you work in policy issues. Uh, they believe that you are wasting your career uh, thinking out of the box. And right now, uh, a PhD student is trained in the same way as 50 years ago, maybe. And as Michelle uh, uh, told, what, how about the soft skills that we required in order to improve our communication with the public or with the policymakers even? Uh, do you think that it's a good idea to train people yeah. in, in science policy interfaces, uh, maybe science advice, even specifically in government or, or something like that? Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have also a third speaker. Maybe we can start with you, Nahed. Yes, thank you very much. Nahed Samur from Humboldt University, Faculty of Law. So I had an impulse when Michelle Lamont was uh, talking and giving us so many ideas about how can we can raise, increase the 
uh, impact and visibility of our scholarship, which, uh, as Sven Becker had also said, you know, as, if you think it's relevant to you, then it might as well be relevant to the world, right? Um, but at the same time, I was thinking um, about studies conducted that show that some people are attacked more than others for either their study, their findings, or for who they are, right? And I'm still speaking here about, you know, you know, people doing their utmost to, you know, show evidence and, you know, but, but still there's attacks out there, right? Because the more polarization you have in the political sphere, you also have that within the university. It's not necessarily two distinct systems here, right? And so my question is, is really, you know, what would maybe universities need to do to back their scholars? And while I'm raising that question, I'm also deeply skeptical of universities by, like themselves, of protecting, like again, then the question would be who are they protecting, who are they not protecting, you know? And this, there's a slippery slope here, you know? Because I don't want to necessarily get into the nature of these findings, but I want to say that um, for some people, um, showing the relevance of the work becomes very time consuming, nerve wracking, anxious, you know? And that doesn't, you know, within kind of maybe a circle of experts, they wouldn't find you, they wouldn't see why is that so controversial here, right? But the moment you enter uh, the public sphere. So really, what is it that universities would need to do? Or maybe beyond, what is it that a kind of collectivity of scholars would need to do? Do we have to think of ourselves as embracing these questions and protecting that kind of sphere where these conversations can uh, take place without a scholar next time thinking about, is it worth it? Is that tweet worth it, you know? Because obviously that, you know, what we see on Twitter is also an inequality of who's tweeting and who isn't, you know? So being on and off the radar, uh, on and off the radar then becomes a very kind of economic uh, question here. Thank you. Very important, thank you so much. Irina. Can I have something about that? Yeah. Uh, because I think it's so interesting how the, all the questions converge to the same topic. Now, I think we all agree on the point that, that uh, we all, as a social scientist or scientist in general, feel uh, if more than than previously, the need to be politically, where there are so many important things going on, and we also feel this need, all of us, uh, that uh, it, it's, it's something that we cannot just sit down at our, do our research in the ivory tower, but have to engage at TED Talks or, or whatever we can have an, um, um, an influence. I agree deeply on that, and precisely because of this, I want to raise an issue that sort of spoils a little the enjoyment of this uh, 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 shared agreement. I'm a sociologist, and in sociology, we know since Weber time that the issue is complicated. It's not so easy to use sociology, uh, so social uh, science for public, uh, political, or even mass media purposes. Uh, well, now I work in system theory. People work in system theory know there's a concept, functional differentiation, which is very popular, by which a system, that you don't have to, to, to agree with that, but to see the point, that claims that in our society, since a couple of centuries, different fields, Bourdieu said similar things, different fields of society have and must have in order to um, cultivate and uh, accept and use the required diversity that we need in society. Uh, different criteria, different methods, different priority, and not necessarily the same criteria of success. So political criteria, scientific criteria, mass media criteria, and besides the law and other uh, fields of our society cannot be coordinated. That the complexity, the fascination, and the difficulty of our modern society. So if you want to put it more uh, bluntly, if you want to do good science, you don't necessarily do good, good politics. So what is, the, what is the condition we are living now? Do we want, we want to have political effect? And Michelle said, we also want to have TED Talks are not politics, are not um, science, clearly. It's basic mass media. No? Uh, we want, uh, you, you talk of uh, infotainment. Uh, in that sense. Those are the, the terms circulating. No? If you want to have this kind of effect, do we have to give up? The, not only necessarily the quality, because it's not a question of quality, the uh, sort of trend, the sort of, um, well, um, uh, well, in Germany, we say the Anschluss fake, uh, the uh, influence of our research in the real scientific field, or how, which solution can we find in order to reach uh, well, uh, well, a personal and political need of the scientists and uh, to, do, to be good scientists, in a sense. 
Very important questions. Um, I would like to chime in myself, but I think there's another speaker who would like to come to the front. Koray would like to come to the front. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you slip away, okay? Don't all go away. <laughs> um, it, two, two short points. One about uh, popularizing points and ways of using it. I tried it around like seven years ago, one million followers on Twitter. Stopped four years ago, still five, half million followers. Two TV shows. Um, two columns a week. It changes you. It's performative. So you find yourself on those podiums, your creativity begins to change and begins to shape you more than you use it to shape public space. I stopped, it didn't go anywhere. I found myself not using the, 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 the tools of the social science that I was trained to do, but find myself, maybe it was my weakness, but um, in many of scientists who chose popular media to reach out, I believe one has to be very careful with, ki with what kind of instrument you go to bed with, especially when it comes to social media. I don't use it anymore. Um, it's over. Only LinkedIn, but just coming here. So um, we have to remember performativity of tools and their agencies that my friend very nicely put in shaping us. The second is about innovative research. I did something strange three years ago. I had to make a decision to continue doing sociology or moving to somewhere else. And I moved somewhere else. It's a design school called Parsons School of Design. And um, we're trying there something revolutionary. I don't think it's a revolution, because when revolutions happen, you don't have to explain that they happen. Everyone knows. <laughs> that's, that's one thing that you don't have to explain, right? I mean, a lot of you know, TED Talk is like, a revolution happened. You didn't hear. Follow my Twitter handle. Nah, nah, nah. I would hear. You don't have to tell me that revolution happened. Um, so um, we try to make to think. We try to make to think. This is methodologically something that I was not trained to do at NYU when I had a Doctor of Philosophy. We had interpretive scholars, we had rational choice. We have institutionalists, we have this. I, I'm more interpretive, Marxian, trained by feminist anthropologists. So you don't like kind of rational choice and no, we are doing the same thing. Look through the window, write, move on. And our entire university education draws on training someone who's going to be a PhD in the future. No. Um, there is a possibility of opening. I'm, I, I, I'm so sad that Dilip is not here. There is a possibility of opening up research that designers do or artists do to welcome it in sociology. And we, I tried it with designers, but one thing you give up is expertise. You drop it. Not like, I have a PhD and I'm going to, no. No, 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 I don't know. And let's make money. For instance, I write about social theory mostly and economic sociology. And now I teach economic sociology of money by making money. And um, I have a student, Emilia, who works on finance. And right now, they designed, whose father is with us, totally by accident, by the way, um, it, who works on insurance policy design. And she's using economic theory, all right? And most of the economists and many social scientists who try to join us have to unlearn before starting to think. Where is supply and demand? No, wait a minute. So I believe that this is very important. I'm very glad that there is no social science here. Because if we open up that space for uh, making to think, um, it may be in the future more effective. Just to give an example, Swan's work, look future to understand it. Sadia Hartman, a feminist um, historian, um, looked at black women's history in a completely new way, looking at the archive like an artist. This gives me goosebumps. And, um, and um, these possibilities are opening up new ways of writing, and perhaps 
if we do this in the future, um, we, can, we can create a more effective social scientific stance. Think about economists, microeconomists, who misunderstand the world probably more radically than anyone you can imagine. Start their job by a drawing lesson, not social theory. Supply and demand graph, move this, move that. You can understand diminishing supply or increasing demand when you put them onto each other that Alfred Marshall did. He was ashamed. He buried it in a footnote when he first um, published it for the first time. Then now, it's the most important design intervention in human history. From the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party, to, to uber capitalist Wharton Business School, they teach it the same way. So they started with making to think, but they reached wrong conclusions, and perhaps we can um, fix that now. Thank you, Korai. You can stay here. You can leave the microphone there. Daria, you would like to come on. Sabina would like to come on. Ellen, I would like to say. I to go down, but I see a little thing before. Since I was here to uh, to not leave Russia alone, but before sitting down, I just say a very short remark connected to what uh, Korai said, because. When I heard you, I, I just want to propose to discuss on this difference. Do we have to understand the difference, the, uh, the, the relationship between two different fields, like the one you are described, as having an effect on the field, or can we just think about irritating the field? So you go there with your knowledge in a different um, area, like design or economics, and you don't want to have an effect on the field. You also produce an irritation that will be elaborated and uh, processed producing probably something you didn't think about. And that's a way, of course, you have to uh, completely adjust your feedback to understand what you're going. But I think that's what, in my understanding, what you said goes in this direction rather than, well, having a um, goal that you want to reach when you um, open a different field. Yes, I would like to uh, make a remark upon some of the things that were going on here. And in relation to to one of the things that Swan said before, that one of the things that uh, made global capitalism so effective is uh, the division of labor. And this is something we can't imagine ourselves without anymore. And uh, now I have what I have been he hearing right now, I have been reinterpreting it in the sense of uh, also societal division of labor, that academics are there to do their academic jobs and their research and potentially creating these irritations. And uh, one example that came to my mind, and this probably will now uh, ir irritate, <laughs> hopefully will irritate Sabine now, uh, is uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Annette Markham. She has been doing this uh, project for a while that is called, if I remember correctly, Museum of uh, what something memory. So the point there was that people were invited to donate a memory either something they want to remember or something they want to forget. It was a public intervention to actually start science communication in the field of datification. Not with a TED talk, not with something she was not doing it herself, but rather cooperating with artists, actually trying to mm, make people for the first time think, what does it even mean, memory in the digital space? And this is something that me and my colleagues are right now trying to do around the topic of algorithmic governance. We are now creating, again, co collaborating with artists. So we are not you know, inventing these interventions ourselves. We are sort of briefing the artists with our science interventions, who then are supposed to create artistic interventions that are supposed to then somehow spread across society to actually create more knowledge on this topic, rather than us trying to tweet our latest research paper, and kind of this is the way to go. And this would then be very much based into this idea of division of labor, but with more maybe points of interconnection. Yeah, talking of interconnections and societal tissue, I think artists are so important in our science communications. And also, we are not alone. There are also journalists that I, that I, want, I want to highlight the role of the press and, and that there are many informed and very good journalists who do a great job. And in a way, we need these, these interconnections. Yeah? We, we, we as scientists can't do it all alone as academics. And we don't need to do it alone. We don't need necessarily to be 
performers, but how can we communicate our insights in a productive way, meaning, as uh, I think Sven, Sven said, that to remain not just teaching but also learning, right? To, to have this openness, this mutual exchange in a, with the societal tissue, so bringing artists and journalists in and the public. And I would like and to bring the more students. And the students, I just count as academics right now, but of course, yes. Yes, more people coming to the front. Sabina, I know, would like to come. And Sven, come, come on. As long as there are microphones here, you are invited to come to the front. Just um, for me, just a couple of remarks kind of following on some of the great interventions before. Uh, so uh, maybe, first of all, addressing this question around division of labor, actually, uh, just brought up, and the idea of disciplines. I mean, I don't know, from the more history of science perspective, disciplines are very dubious objects, and I think we have to be very, very careful with framing the discussion in those terms. I mean, I think there is a spectrum here, and probably, which is this very tent exemplifies the space of social science and humanities and the perception of those fields by other parts of academia I think weighs heavily in the way we're framing the discussion now. But in fact, I mean, at least in lots of work that we have been developing in philosophy and history of science, we're really moving away from thinking about disciplines per se. We're thinking about formations, we call them repertoires, of particular ways of arranging different disciplinary insights, different types of technologies, the way in which they align with ideologies and funding streams, and in which you create these, um, you know, visions of interdisciplinary research, and that's what actually gives meaning to that label, the fact that there is a lot of that going on, but they're all very channeled along kind of, in a sense, franchising type of research that keeps reproducing itself. So you still see divisions, but they're not divisions along what we would traditionally see as disciplines. And this matters a lot, because then the question for me always becomes less maybe a question of how do I intervene in this particular discipline, but more how do I see certain alignments of scholarship and how do we disrupt those in ways that can be productive and particularly allow people like us in this tent to intervene in, in ways which are more productive. So in that sense, and going back maybe to uh, a couple of things that came up that David started that discussion and even Alma uh, brought up, how do we communicate to technologists on the one end, but also to policy? I mean, I think there, there's interesting interplay in so many different publics and audiences we can address. I guess in my work, I've been trying to intersect with social media and do some of that, but I mostly really focused on education on the one end and policy on the other. And I think in education, there's very interesting work to be done about you know, re again, reimagining interdisciplinary education. I mean, for me, trying to educate a lot of data scientists has been a really interesting exercise because that's a, a direct exercise day after day in bringing social science and humanities ideas to an audience which really starts off basically hating the whole idea that they have to sit in my course. Right, but usually that, I think, has been incredibly instructive for me, and I very much hope for them. That's the feedback I'm getting. So I think doing this kind of work, even as educators, is, is you know, it's a big part of what we do, and it's certainly not to be, kind of, you know, we, we shouldn't forget that that's really part of what we're doing, also as popularizers, for some of the things that we do. And the other is, I think, at least in my experience, and there's representatives of the Global Young Academy here, which I'm very grateful to, because they started me off on that journey, um, working with governmental institutions as an academic, for me, has been incredibly useful, both because it provides an interesting platform where you meet other academics who are also interested in making social change, um, you know, as, as, as very uh, nicely put, um, but uh, on a level where you're immediately faced with what does it mean in terms of governance, what does it mean in terms of policy. So I think there is a lot of very interesting work to be done, especially because I think uh, many of us can have agency in multiple countries when doing this kind of work, which again is also very interesting because it brings very different ideologies of what democracy means in different contexts, in potential context with each other. I mean, some people talk about this as science diplomacy, right? Whichever um, uh, label you want to put on it, I think that's also an interesting tool to consider in this conversation. Thank you, Sabina. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I can really build on what uh, Sabina said, and I just wanted to add two further dimensions in the field of science and society here, which I think is in, important. Uh, Sabina already spoke about diversity in the sense of uh, diversity in, in nations and, and backgrounds, but I think uh, social diversity in the, well, there was a lot of talking about class here as 
well. And uh, I think scientists uh, come from a certain class, at least in Germany. The reproduction of social strata, you can put it as you want, is, is an empirical uh, knowledge that there is not uh, people from the working class being a scientist in 10 years. That is uh, of the past. And I think this is important if we talk about how change comes into society. Um, we have to reflect uh, that there is a huge distance uh, in the composition, and that's probably also right if you look at uh, skin color, uh, at uh, other uh, cultural backgrounds. Um, and that was one aspect. And the second aspect is citizen science. I think this is... Well, it's, it's a small element which adds uh, in, in mainly in the uh, applied sciences a lot uh, of um, yeah, uh, perspectives on uh, how science and society can better work together. And there are uh, aspects in the social sciences, I'm sure, as well. Thank you. Thanks. Again, such an important point. Um, as academics, um, we are individuals and who are we actually representing? And again, which story are we telling about ourselves and how diverse are we and, and, and how far are we really creating data that, that is meant for everyone in general? Yeah. Sven, you also would like to I chime just in. Wanted, uh, very, very quickly, I just want to pitch in for Michelle's argument about the need to reach out to broader audiences and to, make, uh, to share our research findings with society at large. I think uh, we, have, we, we are talking about issues, we are researching issues that are of great relevance to uh, many people's lives in many different parts of the world. Uh, these issues have a real political impact. There are ideas out there that interpret the word, um, some of which are not exactly corresponding to what we find in our own research. And thus, I think we have a responsibility to share what we find in our research uh, with, with the wider world and also to communicate with the wider world. I must say, personally, for me, this comes completely natural. And it is, uh, it is also a way for me often to clarify my own thinking about problems, because I feel like if I can communicate my ideas to people who are not expert in my field, uh, it often clarifies the ideas in the first place and also in the interaction with audiences that are not primarily academic audiences, I learn a lot about the word and it does in turn have an influence in how I interpret, in, interpret uh, the word. Uh, and you know, in much of the world, uh, we are in the privileged position that we are in, namely that, as I mentioned earlier, that we can just read books and spend time in libraries and archives and write and think, because you know, other people provide the resources for us to be able to do so. And so I also feel like we have a certain responsibility to talk uh, to, uh, to, to larger audiences who, you know, it's through often very mundane labor, enable us to do the kinds of things uh, that we do. I think one good way uh, uh, that, I, that this has been mentioned before, I, I'm working often with artists, and I have really noticed that many artists are almost researchers themselves. I mean, they, 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 the process of them producing art is embedded within a process of research, and they are very interested in sharing ideas with us, and of course, they have ways of communicating to an audience that is quite different from, uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from our own abilities. And last but not least, the one conversation that I think is missing here is, uh, you know, in a way, we are again segregated here into kind of this sphere of social sciences and humanities, while across the I'll hear they talk about the issues that truly matter. No, this I don't mean that, but <laughs> <laughs> but but you know they they are creating the world of tomorrow, and uh, and I think I think we need to be part of these conversations. You know, this is in itself a huge problem that uh, that there is a segregation here between, on the one hand, the humanities and social science scholars, and the other hand, the people who design the world of tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks. Um, please just come to the front. I will just um, answer or, or give some thoughts that I have on that. I also think it's quite interesting that, of course, we keep to these disciplines. I mean, we've just heard we have to go to beyond the disciplines. And, the, and, and as a matter of fact, we are actually in our research constantly doing that. Uh, but the infrastructure is a different one. Right, the infrastructure is still quite divided. Um, my own research as a medievalist, I'm trying to put up a research group with neurologists, and we're looking at mental imagery. 
um, because actually the history of mental imagery eclipses thousand years of the Middle Ages as if Descartes followed Aristotle and as if in the thousand years in between nothing happened in terms of um, I what images in the, in, in the inner eye, in front of the inner eye. And there's plenty to learn from medieval scholars, in fact. And I found neurologists who are interested in that and working on a common terminology and a common framework, but try to get funding for that. Try to find funding where you can actually apply with such a project because the panels, the reviewing, the reviewing panels are not divided like that. If I, I submit this for the ERC or another or DFG or whatever, I have to choose history or neurology. Now, I'm not a neurologist, right? But I want to work with neurologists. So, and then also internationally, that's the next thing, especially with national funding. Where does the money go to? Where does it come from? So the infrastructure is heavy and it's slow, right? And we want to be fast and we are fast and we have good ideas and we want to break through through that wall over there and um, have semi-permeable walls, right? Walls will, I think walls are a kind of uh, interesting way to think of, of, of our disciplines, of our research, but please let them be at least semi-permeable. Right, and uh, with that, I think we have two more opinions on the front. I'm very excited about. I'm not quite sure. Not being a scientist, how this works. Um, is it on? Yeah, it's on. It's on. Just a bit closer. I really liked what what Sven was saying. Closer. I really liked what Sven was saying, and you've very very much kind of echoing what I wanted to say, is that. I'm an anthropologist and a feminist anthropologist working with ideas of ethics of care, things that are like a very kind of um, vague um, to the hard scientists. And I work in the faculty of science, in earth sciences, because my area is water. So the people I work with are hydrologists, geologists, um, and it's quite, you know, it's lovely to be in an area where people are social scientists, but in my domain, they're not. And so I often ask the question, is the onus on me to speak to them and get my language across? Or, you know, like how much responsibility do I have as a social scientist to make things understood? And I think there's also just the one point, um, look at the flows of capital. Like in our projects on river biology, on river flows, on hydrology, there are huge budgets, you know, millions. In my terms, I'm at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa in terms of RAND. There are huge amounts of money that go to the hard scientists. And there's a tiny little budget. I work on citizens and science and measuring, monitoring wells in rural areas. There's a tiny budget. You know, people expect you to bring people on board and have workshops like in, in a day where it takes a year to do that kind of work. So I think that there's a lot of education that needs to go to the donors as to how to value social science and to value the time frames and the diversity and the difference and the difficulties and the complexities that as social scientists you have working in huge multidisciplinary teams. That's all. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, maybe a, a few words uh, to me. I'm uh, Jan Wetzel, a PhD candidate um, at the University uh, of Technology in Dresden and also at the WZB. Um, I want to add um, yeah, also to the points uh, that were being said from the perspective from a PhD student, because my feeling is sometimes that these um, risks that are involved uh, working in other fields, trying out ideas that maybe won't uh, yeah, uh, um, work inside academia, they're not, um, yeah, not being um, de developed so much. So what was being said before, you feel like I have to work on this PhD and have for the academic career, but like these other ways, and we see this uh, like a lot of successes uh, in other sciences that have like programs for incubators and trying to find ways. How do these uh, ideas work outside of a science? How can they can become? companies out of this, how it can become all kinds of different organizations and NGOs and stuff like this, like other other uh, yeah, types of social um, social in institutions um, that are growing out of the science. They will become something else. I think this point is very important that science can't be uh, ma mass media. These are different uh, ways of uh, shaping the world. But I don't feel like uh, it's, um, it's nourished uh, so well in the uh, um, uh, social sciences. Uh, one 
example, um, because I, I always feel like this is really interesting, colleagues uh, from the WCB um, who are still at the WCB, they founded a car sharing company or a car sharing startup in the 90s. Uh, so this was uh, 25, 25 years ago, and of course there are reason, uh, reasons why nothing uh, or why it didn't work out in the end. But 20 years later, big, f big uh, capital comes, uh, all these huge uh, companies come, uh, science comes, uh, and now car sharing is kind of a technological idea. Of course, in this technology that's being deployed today, as we all know. There is also concepts of, of society in there, kind of technocratic concepts, kind of very economistic in a certain way, economistic concepts. Um, but they're coming now from the technology side uh, with these with these f philosophies and sociologies uh, embedded in them. I, uh, f sometimes I feel like, okay, wh how would this the technology look like if sociolo sociologists uh, and people from other sciences would have built this? They only could have, of course, if they maybe went out of science uh, or out of the social sciences at a certain point, and then build new knowledge that uh, that uh, uh, that's uh, yeah necessary to talk to the people who design the technical systems, of course. Um, and I don't feel like um, sometimes that, that is being rewarded or even thought of as a certain career path that can be nourished inside the academia. Um, so maybe there have to be ways, not just working with artists and other groups, but always feel like, okay, maybe I can end up in a company, maybe doing something technical, but I do come from sociology because also the technical is uh, <laughs> always uh, sociological. Um, so maybe we have to find programs or institutions inside the academia that in, uh, I confess, in cases like mine where I feel like, oh, maybe I don't want to do the scientific career, uh, to, to uh, still say, okay, but you can bring, bring the stuff you really learned, not in a direct way, but in an indirect way in other fields. Thank you, Jan. I mean, you, 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 you are actually talking about a general problem for especially PhD students, but also postdocs, which is, am I still an academic if I leave academia? Am I still, um, am I still doing what I'm trained to do? And that's, that's I think, a real issue um, that is often um, neglected and not talked about, but is, is actually quite important in, for early career researchers. Right, um, and to to also accept that there are various fields where you can bring in your expertise, maybe in the library, in the archive, which would have been my plan B, the archives, <laughs> um, or media, or as you say, even in in the economy, in in the, in the market, so-called market. David, please come to the front. Um, we need you. We need you to speak into a microphone because this is live broadcast, as you see. So the. Yeah, <laughs> It's to it's to it's Jan, yeah. yeah. So, you know there are programs that um, have jobs for PhDs in social science, and they're at Facebook and Uber, yeah. and um, you know the chief trust officer at Uber has a PhD in sociology. So I I heard what you said, that is happening, but I if I understood correctly. What, what you're thinking about are jobs not in the private corporate platform world, but in a, what, working with NGOs, activists? Um, look, what, what did you have in mind? Because you, you don't seem like you're, ready, you're headed to Uber. Uh, maybe I can uh, clarify that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily make the distinction be between companies making money and companies not making money. I think there are like different ways of making money and Uber and Facebook are like a certain very, very specific kind of company that doesn't even reflect like most of what is going on uh, in the economy. Um, uh, but as you said, there are like different ways, uh, companies, I think also you can do something like a social network. You can do this in very different ways. You can uh, do any kind of uh, uh, way in, in, in different ways. And sometimes I don't feel like we really think about these alternatives and that most of what is being done in these big companies is not because of the thing that the company does itself, but because it's a certain structure. It's uh, it's built on the on a big capital. And it's not like the social network itself, but the capital structure that is behind behind it and that shapes what the company is doing 
specifically and kind of uh, some some decisions that are being made i think some of these things can be done differently they can be done in different ways in a company in an ngo uh in in um, yeah in like a broad way of, of of types of institutions but of course uh, I, your point is very important that it's not just about sociology in different organization but it's of course a kind of a political way always uh, and of course in the end of democratization. Um, sociology can be done in a te technocratic way that doesn't help um, uh, that doesn't help democratization but I feel like a lot of scholars do have this <laughs> democratic impulse they don't want to go uh, uh, be like chief of uh, um, sociological department of Facebook um, or at Ford for example um, uh, um, they had like uh, just just to add that like the first first um, or, uh, department of the Ford company that kind of took care of the of the workers uh, leading a good life it was called the sociological department um, uh, when when this uh, word wasn't even around back then. Thank you. To distill some of the thoughts we have heard, next to innovation and breakthroughs, we need self-reflection. Who are we? What stories are we telling? We need transparency. How do we work? Um, and we need, we are in dire need of communication. And that's not just communication to the public, that's communication to other groups that share um, our, our intrinsic, rigorous um, passion for research, yeah? artists, journalists, um, other, others who have been trained. Um, so next to innovation and breakthroughs, these three, I think, are very important. I have two announcements before we conclude and go off for a lunch break. Um, the first announcement is that on your short program on the back of your name card, it says um, that the plenary table is at 4. That's not right. It's at 3 p.m. So uh, the plenary session, the future of work and urban planning, is at 3 p.m. in the lecture hall. And the second announcement is that um, after that... Um, Oh no, just before that, there are workshops. So after the lunch breaks, there are two workshops um, you can participate in. And workshop A has uh, the theme global, global trends in academia. And the question here is, what concrete challenges and opportunities will global shifts in academic culture and research pose to you in the next decade? Um, so what specific challenges, I think it's meant here, what specific challenges and opportunities are there um, and then workshop B is about research in a pandemic or the pandemic I suppose can you share um, a specific experience decision or plan that relates to researching the pandemic now the way you're going to choose these workshops is you're going to pick a slip of paper when you ex exit uh, this door um, and it says workshop A or workshop B and this is your entry ticket to the workshop so workshop A, global trends in academia, what are the next topics? And workshop B, research in a pandemic, um, what is our experience and what can we do? Um, so thank you very much again for, for our speakers and for all of you for um, interacting and engaging in a very, very exciting morning. And we'll see each other again in the afternoon in this room. Thanks so much. <laughs>